R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 3, Chapters 18 through 22. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI Neural Voice. Chapter 18, The Bloody Climax of a Hurried Race. Spotsylvania, May 812, 1864. Stealthily the Confederate skirmishers wormed their way through the shell-torn wilderness on the morning of May 8. Cautiously the infantry peered over the rough entrenchments. Anxiously at the tap house, Lee waited for word from the outposts. It came quickly. The Federals were gone from the Confederate left and center, gone, and not in the direction of the Rapidan. At first, the reports indicated that the Federals had moved down the river toward Fredericksburg. Lee so advised the War Department, but soon he received a dispatch from General Hampton stating that Channing Smith, one of the most daring and reliable of his scouts, had just returned from a ride within the enemy's lines and was quite positive that the V Corps was on the road toward Todd's Tavern. As that resort was on the road to Spotsylvania Courthouse, Lee at once set out for the courthouse and dispatched orders to Ewell to move the Second Corps to Shady Grove Church. On his way Lee learned that A. P. Hill had become so sick overnight that it would not be possible for him to continue in command. That was no small addition to the burden of the commanding general at a moment when his adversary was seeking to outflank him. Longstreet badly wounded on the 6th, Hill incapacitated on the 8th, two of the three corps passing into the hands of new men, and Ewell himself apt to collapse at any time. It seemed as if the high command was to be destroyed in the face of the enemy, for in addition to the disabled chiefs of corps, General J. M. Jones and General Micah Jenkins had been killed, General L. Stafford had been mortally wounded, and Generals John P. Grimm and Henry L. Benning had been seriously hurt. There could, of course, be no delay in filling Hill's place. Lee designated Early to act in his stead and arranged it that General John B. Gordon, who had so distinguished himself on the 6th, should have command of Early's division. Probably by the time Lee reached Shady Grove Church, he learned that his expectation of a federal move to Spotsylvania Courthouse had been realized, and more than realized, Anderson had reached that point and was already engaged hotly in defending it. Lee pressed on when he heard this. Leaving behind him Ewell's troops, who were marching wearily through the dust and smoke of the burning forest, he reached the vicinity of the courthouse before 2.30 p.m. He then discovered that there had been a race between his army and Grant's for Spotsylvania, and that Anderson had won, though by the narrowest of margins. General Stewart had covered the route of Anderson's advance and had guarded the roads by which the Unionists would move toward the courthouse. Fitzley had been attacked by infantry on the road leading to Spotsylvania from Todd's Tavern and Rosser, with one brigade, defending the courthouse proper, had been assailed by a mounted federal division. Both Fitzley and Rosser had fought stubbornly during the early morning of the 8th, but they had been pushed slowly back and had been close to disaster when the head of Anderson's corps had come up on the double quick and had relieved them. Subsequent federal assaults had been beaten off, with heavy loss to the enemy. It was a close escape from a turning movement that would have cost the Army of Northern Virginia dearly. Anderson deserved high credit because he had started early and had pushed on vigorously. It was, perhaps, his greatest single service to the Confederate cause. Stewart had directed the defense around Spotsylvania with the utmost skill. But behind these reasons for deliverance lay the conclusion of Lee on the afternoon of the 7th that Grant would move toward Spotsylvania. Had Lee not reasoned that his adversary would march in that direction, Grant would have outgeneraled him. There was a lull in the fighting after Lee arrived. The Federal cavalry withdrew, Spotsylvania Courthouse was in the hands of Anderson, and the infantry who had attacked him appeared to have been well beaten. Prisoners said the force was the whole of the V Corps. As the anxious afternoon wore on, however, signs of a new effort to destroy Anderson began to multiply. The VI Corps was reported to have come up to join the V in a sharp new assault. At five o'clock the storm broke. Over the fields and through the woods, the long, heavy clouds of bluecoats swept. But Confederate artillery was confident, and the attacks were not pushed on a wide front. Only on Lee's extreme right did danger develop. There, the Federal left overlapped for some distance and seemed in a fair way of enveloping the Confederate flank. 
but Lee's logistics did not fail him. Ewell had been told to hurry on, as Anderson might need support, and now, precisely at the moment it was needed, the head of the Second Corps appeared on the road from Shady Grove. Rhodes's division was leading and was at once thrown in on Anderson's right. It speedily broke up the enemy's flank attack, drove him back some distance, and put an end to the day's fighting. Johnson's division formed on the right of Rhodes and, as night was coming on, was placed in a body of oak timber with instructions to throw up works. With direction indicated chiefly by the federal campfires stretched out in front of them, the men dug with much zeal and, ere morning, had a line they steadily strengthened. Gordon's division was held in reserve. The Third Corps, which had been the last to leave the wilderness position, bivouacked for the night northwest of Todd's Tavern. On the safe assumption that Early would arrive promptly with this corps, General Lee would have his whole force again in front of the Army of the Potomac on the morning of May 9. The movement from the wilderness was being completed without difficulty or serious loss. The army still stood between Grant and Richmond. That meant much. At the same time, the enemy was in immense strength and seemed determined to break through and to bear down all opposition. The whole demeanor of the Unionists was far different from what it had ever been in Virginia during any previous campaign. More than that, the other offensives in the state were becoming serious. General B. F. Butler had landed in force on the south side of James River between the Appomattox and Drury's Bluff and had cut the Richmond and Petersburg Railroad. A cavalry column had burned a railroad bridge at Stony Creek, between Petersburg and Weldon, where it would certainly delay Beauregard's army, which was coming up slowly from the Carolinas. In the Shenandoah Valley, General Siegel was still at Winchester, but could be expected to move at any time. Two forces of cavalry in the southwestern area were threatening the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad as well as the mines on which the state relied for nearly all its salt. Nowhere was there any sign that the pressure exerted by the enemy was lightning. Everything, on the contrary, indicated that General Grant intended to fight on. A long campaign was thus in prospect, with scant hope of reinforcements. It was more necessary than ever to conserve the strength of the Army of Northern Virginia. Lee did not intend to abandon offensive strategy if the enemy gave him an opening, but as long as Grant continued to attack where he could be repulsed without heavy southern losses, it obviously was to Lee's advantage to maintain the defensive. Provided the enemy could be held at a distance from Richmond and from the vital lines of communication, this course was as safe as it was profitable. We have succeeded so far, Lee wrote Davis on May 9, in keeping on the front flank of Grant's army and impeding its progress without a general engagement, which I will not bring on unless a favorable opportunity offers or as a last resort. With the blessing of God, I trust we shall be able to prevent General Grant from reaching Richmond, and I think this army could render no more effectual service. We could not successfully resist a larger force than that to which we are opposed, and it is of the first moment that we should have timely information of any increase. To prepare the ground for this defensive, Lee was up and eating his breakfast by 3 a.m. on May 9. Longstreet's absence and Hill's illness put upon him such a burden of work that he had to make this his regular hour of rising during the campaign. He was usually occupied, with little or no opportunity for rest, until nine or ten or even later in the evening. Heavy as were the demands on his physique and on his intellect, the line he drew when early brought up Hill's Corps on the ninth showed that his engineering skill and military judgment were unimpaired. Spotsylvania Courthouse lies on a ridge between the Put and New York rivers, two of the small streams that contribute their waters and their names to the Mattapony. This ridge is about three and a half miles wide at Spotsylvania and is a well-secured military position because the rivers, though they are not wide, are deep, to quote General Grant, with abrupt banks and bordered by heavily wooded and marshy bottoms and difficult to cross except when bridged. To cover the courthouse and the three important roads that led southward from it, Lee drew a crude semicircle with the p as its diameter. Several nights were spent in extending this front. When the line was completed the extreme right was a trifle more than three miles from the extreme left, and the whole position was compact and thoroughly defensible, except for a long salient on the left center. This was occupied by Johnson's division of the Second Corps and was to play a gloomy part in the conflict. 
Lee's front, Colonel Henderson wrote, was exactly adapted to the numbers he had at his disposal, in order to turn the position his adversary would have to cross one of the streams and so divide his army, giving him an opportunity of dealing with him in detail, and his line was far stronger than that which he had held in the wilderness. Part of the front had open ground in the direction of the Federal advance. Elsewhere the chief weakness of the position was that the woods came close to the line. As far as practicable, abatis were set. The artillery was located with much care. Anderson held the left, Ewell the center, and Early, when he came up on the ninth, occupied the right, which was gradually extended southward. The strength of the line was the more remarkable when it is remembered that it was not laid out at leisure but was started from the positions taken up by the infantry on May 8 and was then developed to make the most of the natural advantages of the adjacent terrain. It was not only the entrenchments, said Henderson, but the natural features of the ground also on which Lee relied in his defensive tactics. His eye for ground must have been extraordinary. Before Lee's field fortifications were carried as far as he desired, either on the right or on the left, he had need of them. On the afternoon of the 9th, the enemy's skirmishers felt out Anderson's lines with some vigor. A little later in the day a strong force was reported on the south side of the pit in the direction of the Shady Grove Road. If this force advanced to the bend of the river it would be able to enfilade the extreme left of the Confederate line on the other side of the stream. And, again, if the enemy continued to press eastward, south of the Pa, he would reach the highway from Spotsylvania to Louisa Courthouse, along which Lee had placed his wagon train. The move, however, placed a relatively small part of the Federal Army in a position where it could be attacked before it could be reinforced. Lee made the most of this. First, he ordered Early to send one of his divisions from the extreme right to the extreme left so as to extend the left flank of Field's division and to protect it from an enfilade. At the same time, Lee instructed Early to dispatch another division south of the Put and to assail the enemy advancing eastward on the Shady Grove Road. Haight's division, chosen for this purpose, moved early on the morning of May 10, found Federals in the vicinity of Waite's shop that afternoon, and proceeded to attack. The Unionists at once began to withdraw, but some of the force held their ground and repulsed several very hard assaults by Haight. In the end the Federals retired across the Puh, leaving one gun and some prisoners in Confederate hands. Meantime, north of the Puh, interest shifted to the point where the right of the First Corps joined the left of the Second. This part of the front had given Lee no little concern. On the 9th, General Lee had seen its weakness and, at the instance of General Ewell, had consented to its extension farther to the northward to include some high ground from which it was believed the Federal artillerists could have dominated the Confederate position if they had been allowed to remain there. The inclusion of this elevation made that sector a great, irregular angle, with the apex to the north. Its average width was about half a mile and its depth approximately one mile. The soldiers promptly dubbed it the mule shoe. Lee contemplated the construction of a second line across the base of the angle and is said to have issued orders to have the work started. This, however, was a rather large undertaking because the greater part of the interior of the angle was wooded. Either the woods had to be cleared, or else the baseline had to be located where the enemy would have cover under which to approach unobserved. Artillery had been placed at the apex of the angle and the entrenchments had been so strengthened that many officers felt the position could be held until there was leisure to prepare the line in rear of it. Nonetheless, Lee was studying the terrain closely and that afternoon had his headquarters within the angle, some 150 yards in rear of Dole's brigade, of Rhodes's division. This brigade occupied a position about midway the northwest face of the salient and had a battery of the Richmond Howitzer's battalion supporting it. In front of Dole's swerks were Abydus and in rear of them was a partially completed second line. The only condition that made his position especially vulnerable from the Confederate point of view was that thick, low-hanging pine woods came within 200 yards of the works. During the day several attacks against Anderson's lines were beaten off. As the hot afternoon passed there were signs of federal activity nearer the center toward six o'clock, heavy guns began to bombard the western face of the salient. On the hour, the firing ceased. In about ten minutes there was a wild cheer, followed quickly by the opening of hot infantry fire. 
Soon a courier hurried up to Lee with the startling news that Dole's lines had been broken, that the howitzers had been captured, and that the enemy was pouring into the salient. Lee at once mounted and started forward to rally the men, but his staff officers protested that he must not go where the fire would almost certainly be fatal. When at length they dissuaded him from rushing into the action, he said, then you must see to it that the ground is recovered. Colonel Taylor flung himself on his horse and galloped into the fury of the fight. Colonel Venable hurried off to bring part of Johnson's division to the left. Lee sought out the nearest battery and instructed its commander, Captain A. W. Garber, to leave his guns and to take his men forward to serve the captured howitzers, which he was sure the Confederates would recover in a few minutes. The fire by this time was as violent as any that had ever been heard in the battles of the Army of Northern Virginia, but the southern troops on either side of the gap began to close in, and those who had been driven out reformed on the second line. Taylor, seizing a flag and still mounted, led the men onward, in company with other officers. The Federals, who were admirably handled by Colonel Emery Upton, resisted with the utmost determination. They received no reinforcements, however, and were slowly pushed out of the works. By nightfall, the danger was passed, and the line had been restored. The Confederate loss was subsequently estimated at 650, but was probably higher. That evening, as if to expiate the butchery, a Confederate band played nearer, my God, to thee, and a Union band answered with the dead march from Saul. To the end of the third day at Spotsylvania, then, the attacks of the enemy had been repelled with heavy casualties. The margin of safety had been a little narrower than usual, to be sure, but there had been nothing to indicate any decline in the prowess of the army. The veterans who stood behind their earthworks and mowed the enemy down suffered far less than did the Federals. Still, it was now a week since the three corps had left their cantonments on the Rapidan, and the enemy showed no disposition to suspend his costly assaults. More than that, ugly news came from the rear. The Federal cavalry, now under a new commander, Major General Phil H. Sheridan, had slipped around the flank of the Confederate Army, and on the 9th had struck the Central Railroad at Beaver Dam Creek, where two locomotives, three trains of cars, most of the reserve stores of the Army and 504,000 rations of bread and 904,000 of meat had been destroyed. The railroad had been torn up and culverts had been demolished for some distance. Then the Union horse had moved on toward Richmond, while Stuart, gathering his scattered units, pushed the endurance of weary men and hungry mounts to the absolute limit in an effort to get between Sheridan and Richmond. Lee was accustomed to federal raids by this time and expected from them a measure of annoyance without serious injury to the army, but in this instance he saw the fulfillment of all the fears he had felt during the winter concerning the cavalry. If the horses did not hold out, so that Stuart could at least protect the scant supplies that were reaching the army, then anything might happen. May 11 dawned dark. Hate was moved back from the south side of the Pud to the vicinity of Spotsylvania, while Mahone remained to guard the extreme left of the First Corps. General Lee spent part of the morning examining carefully the rear of Rhodes's lines, against which the attack of the previous evening had been directed. He was accompanied by General M. L. Smith, chief engineer, and was convinced that the mule shoe could be held with the help of the artillery. General Edward Johnson, who commanded at the apex of the salient, went up beyond the skirmish line and failed to find the enemy. Lee, however, gave instructions that if the enemy should attack any part of the front in the vicinity of the salient, Gordon should at once advance Early's division in support without waiting for further orders. During the early afternoon the rain began to fall heavily, and the enemy, who had been silent all morning, began to bestir himself. There were renewed demonstrations on the left, as if the Federals were planning to cross the Pu again. Lee promptly ordered Early to send troops to the south of the river and told him to occupy Shady Grove. Before Early began his move with two brigades of Wilcox's division, surprising dispatches arrived at General Headquarters from Rooney Lee, who was in rear of the enemy's left flank. He reported that the Federal wounded had been sent to Belle Plaine and that their wagons had been underway all night. It was impossible to tell, from the information Rooney forwarded, whether the move was southward in the direction of the Annas or northward in retreat to Fredericksburg. In either case, the information was so circumstantial that Lee felt he should prepare the army for instant movement. Many of the batteries were in advanced positions and would be very difficult to withdraw during the darkness. 
Lee directed that all guns so situated should be brought off before nightfall to prevent delay in case of sudden orders to begin the march. At the Harrison House, within the Mule Shoe, Lee conferred with General Ewell and with General Long, Corps Chief of Artillery, and particularly ordered the artillery of Johnson's division withdrawn from the salient as it had to come through thick woods by a single narrow and winding road. It is not certain Lee had subsequent intimation from any quarter that Johnson protested against the withdrawal of these guns and later notified General Ewell that the enemy was becoming active on his front. The suspicions of none of the commanders within earshot seemed to have been aroused by the unusual fact that the enemy's bands struck up about 11 o'clock and continued to play, in the rain and darkness, for hours on end. The music had scarcely died away, and the black of the night was just beginning to change to the grey of a cold, wet fog when there came to Lee's headquarters the rattle of heavy infantry fire from the salient. The general had arisen, as usual, at three o'clock and lost no time in mounting traveller. Riding to the front through woods still so deep in shadows that a line of troops could not have been seen a hundred yards away, he soon encountered men running toward the rear. Without attempting to get from them the story of what had happened, he began to rally them. Taking off his hat so that he might be recognized, he exhorted them to halt. Hold on, he cried. We are going to form a new line. Your comrades need your services. Stop, men. Some heeded him and halted, others ran wildly past him. Shame on you men, shame on you, he called out in his deep voice. Go back to your regiments, go back to your regiments. In a few moments, out of the salient, rode Major Robert W. Hunter of the staff of General Edward Johnson. Hunter was mounted on an artillery horse and shouted his message in his excitement, General, the line is broken at the angle in General Johnson's front. Lee's expression changed instantly. Remembering that he had ordered General Gordon to move his division forward to any point of the salient that might be threatened, he reined Traveller in. Ride with me to General Gordon, he said, and he turned to the left and rear. Perhaps on the way, Hunter had breath to tell him more of what had happened, how Johnson had been on the cavive all night, how the enemy had suddenly burst over the lines held by the Louisiana brigades and by the remnant of J. M. Jones's Virginians, how some of the infantry had found their charges useless because of the rain, how artillery that had been ordered back had arrived just in time for full twenty pieces to fall into the enemy's hands, how General Johnson, hobbling along on a stick had tried to keep the men together, and how the enemy had captured him and General George H. Stewart and most of the division. There were thousands of bluecoats in the salient, the lines of the army were split in twain. Two hundred yards brought Lee to the point where the left of Pegram's brigade was hurriedly forming. Still farther to the left was Gordon's brigade, under Colonel Clement A. Evans. These troops, and Johnston's four regiments, formed the whole of Early's division, which Gordon was temporarily commanding. The three brigades had been scattered when Gordon had ordered them forward to support Johnson, but already Gordon had boldly thrown out the men of Johnston's entire brigade as skirmishers and had ordered them to advance, in the hope that they could hold off the enemy till the other units were ready to charge. A few minutes after Lee reached the flank of Pegram's brigade, Gordon himself came dashing along the line. Meeting Lee, he pulled up his horse on its haunches and saluted, What do you want me to do, General? he asked. Lee, of course, approved the dispositions the Georgian had already made and directed him to proceed with the counterattack. His manner was far calmer than it had been on the morning of May 6, when he had witnessed the break in the lines of Haight and Wilcox in the wilderness, but battle blood was surging in his veins. As Gordon turned to complete his arrangements, Lee rode to the center of the line, between the 52nd Virginia of Pegram's brigade and the 13th Georgia of Gordon's. His hat was still in his hand and he quietly turned Traveler's head to the enemy. By this time a searching fire was penetrating the woods where the Greycoats were taking position. Gordon himself had just escaped death from a bullet that grazed his coat, not an inch from his spine, but when he saw Lee's position, he realized that the general was preparing to join in the charge and he broke out dramatically, General Lee, this is no place for you. Go back, General, we will drive them back. These men are Virginians and Georgians. They have never failed. They never will. Will you, boys? No, no cried every man within hearing distance. General Lee to the rear, Lee to the rear. 
go back, General Lee, we can't charge until you go back. We will drive them back, General. Gordon and some of his officers placed their mounts between him and the enemy, whose fire had come nearer and had increased ominously during the few seconds of delay. A minute more and the enemy would be upon them. Gordon did not wait on military etiquette. Leaning forward, he caught hold of Traveler's bridle, but in the crowding of the flanks of the two brigades, which were now ready to advance, Gordon was pushed behind Lee. Thereupon a sergeant of the 49th Virginia seized Traveler by the reins and jerked his head to the rear. As Lee rode unwillingly back a few paces, he heard the clear voice of Gordon above the roar of the musketry, forward. Guide right. Lee turned to young Robert Hunter, the officer who had brought him the first news of the break on Johnson's front. Major Hunter, said he, collect together the men of Johnson's division and report to General Gordon. Almost before Lee could say even this, Gordon's line of battle had disappeared in a dense growth of old field pines. There was a wild burst of firing, next, a hoarse, quavering, rebel yell, and then comparative silence as the two lines came to grips, too close together to load and fire. To his immeasurable relief, as daylight came, Lee saw that Gordon was driving the Federals up the salient, but he discovered, almost simultaneously, that Gordon's lines were not long enough to cover the whole front on which the enemy was pressing. Others, fortunately, observed this before Lee could issue orders. On the right of the salient, Lane's North Carolinians had already rushed forward and had halted the advance. On the left, Rhodes threw Ramser's brigade into action. Daniel supported Ramser. Together, they held back the flood for a time, but they were so inferior in number that Rhodes began to call for reinforcements. Lee immediately dispatched Colonel Venable to General Mahone, with instructions that one brigade of Mahone be left to cover the crossing of the pond field's left flank and that the rest of the division be dispatched forthwith to aid Rhodes. It was a dangerous thing to do, for the battle was now spreading along the front, but the salient must be held, and, if possible, the lines must be restored. Lee did not concern himself, for the moment, with reinforcing the right of the salient, for he knew that the two brigades of Wilcox's division, which had been sent to the south of the the previous day, had found no enemy there, had returned, and would soon be available to strengthen Lane's gallant defense. Gordon's troops were fighting like men possessed, and by this time were masters of the center of the salient. Soon Scales and Thomas of Wilcox's division were with Lane on the right and were pushing the enemy back toward the apex of the angle. By 6.30 o'clock it was apparent that the Federals were being held, and more than held, except on the left, in front of Ramser and Daniel. Though the battle was doubtful, for the Federals were still throwing in more and more troops, as if their reserves were inexhaustible. Rhodes must have help, and quickly. To provide it, Lee rode off in search of Mahone's division, which was moving up from the right. Not far from the courthouse, he found Harris's brigade resting by the side of the road. In a few words Lee ordered Harris forward to support Rhodes, and took his place by that officer's side to speed the march. The column started briskly forward toward the salient and soon came under artillery fire from long-range federal batteries that were playing on the approaches to prevent the dispatch of reinforcements. Traveler became excited as shells burst around him, and he began to rear wildly. Lee kept his seat and sought to quiet his mount. Once more Traveler reared, and as he did so, a round shot passed under his girth only a few inches from Lee's stirrup. If the horse had not been in the air at the moment, the general would almost certainly have been killed. It was the narrowest escape from death that he had experienced since that day, seventeen years before, when the sentinel had fired on him as he and Beauregard had come out of the covered way at Vera Cruz. Harris's veterans knew and loved Lee well, for they had fought many times under his eye when Carnot Posey had been their leader. They were quick now to see his danger. Go back, general, they yelled go back. For God's sake, go back. And some of them tried to get between him and the enemy's fire, or to turn him to the rear. His anxiety was apparent to all who saw him that day, but his battle ire was aroused, and if he was not personally to have a hand in repelling the enemy from the salient, he must have guaranteed that it would be done. So, simply but stubbornly, he answered their appeal. If you will promise me to drive those people from our works, I will go back. The men shouted their agreement and started on more vigorously than ever. 
Lee told Colonel Venable to guide them to Rhodes's position, and after watching them for a moment with admiring eye, he turned his horse toward Early's lines, on the right of the salient. Harris's men did not arrive a moment too soon. Just as they reached Rhodes at the double quick, an aide galloped up from General Ramser to say that he could hold his ground only a few minutes longer unless help was forthcoming. Before nine o'clock, McGowan's brigade was sent to support Harris. It gave Rhodes enough rifles to halt the Federal advance and to stabilize the fighting on the left side of the salient. Then, gradually, as Gordon and Wilcox pressed them on the center and right of the salient, the Federals were forced back to the apex and ere long were driven over the parapet. In front of this, they rallied once more and refused to be moved. The second phase of the battle was ended. The enemy had attacked successfully, the Confederate counterattack had cleared the salient. What next? Should Lee permit the enemy to remain on the outer side of the parapet, separated from his own men only by the length of a bayonet gun? He was, said Fitz Lee, very sensitive about his lines being broken. It made him more than ever personally pugnacious. All his impulse prompted him to force the enemy back to the woods. Sound tactics dictated the same course. He could not afford to leave the enemy at his parapet if it was possible to drive him out. For the Federals, from that position, would certainly renew the assault when they found an opening and then they might sweep down the salient again. In the face of their attack, it would be impracticable to complete a line in rear of the salient or to withdraw in daylight to it. At the very least, the men must hold on until they could be brought during the night to the gorge of the salient. Word was passed to Gordon and to Rhodes to keep their men at the parapet, to contest every new attack, and to hurl the enemy back if they could. Gallantly enough, they held to their task while Lee hastily examined the rest of the front to see what he could to aid Ewell's men. He decided very soon that he could not accomplish anything on his left. The Federals were already attacking there. Anderson beat them off, thanks to Alexander's readiness with his artillery, but he could not attempt an offensive. On the center and right of Hill's Corps, Lee found that no assaults had been delivered. The enemy seemed absorbed in the operations against Ewell. Already Wilcox's work was over and his part of the line was restored. Both his division and hates were available for a counterstroke, for which the ground seemed favorable. On the front on the line of Hill's Corps, south of the Muleshoe, was a projection-styled hate salient. Troops moving from the right side of this salient would be unseen by the Federals in front of the Muleshoe, and if they reached an oakwood in front of their lines, they would be on the flank of the Federals. Captain Nicholson, commanding sharpshooters, of Lane's brigade, General Wilcox subsequently reported, had explored the woods in front of the right face of the salient on Haight's front and ascertained that the enemy were in line facing the left face of the salient, the right resting in the woods in front of the former face. Lane filed quietly into the woods opposite the right face of the salient and soon had his line at right angles to the enemy's front. Mahone's brigade under Colonel Daniel A. Weisiger was in support. The situation was promising. Before the two brigades could strike, the Federals, who proved to be of Burnside's IX Corps, advanced to attack the left face of Haight's salient. Lee watched them come forward. Hill's artillery opened upon them at once, the infantry fired as soon as they could bring down their mark, and Lane, of course, hit the Federals in flank. As the front of the advancing line shifted somewhat, Lee rode forward under a hot fire and directed that the artillery change its range. The officer who was to deliver the order to other batteries started out immediately by the route over which Lee had come. Have that officer take a road nearer the rear of the line of guns, he said rapidly, it is a safer way. He seemed quite oblivious to the fact that he had done what he did not wish another to attempt. Burnside's attack was quickly repulsed in what was the clearest advantage the Confederates had gained that day. By mid-afternoon, the right was safe and the left could hold its own. Still the fight raged around the mule shoe, which had now earned its more familiar name of the Bloody Angle. Successful in itself, the counterattack by Lane and Weisiger failed to shake the grip of the Federals on the outer side of the parapet. From every vantage point, the Federal artillery, rising to unprecedented violence, poured its fire into the salient and plastered Anderson's lines. The fog gave place to dark clouds that emptied themselves at intervals in violent showers. 
The Federals held to the outer side of the parapet, the Confederates challenged their grip on it. Men were pulled over the parapet from either side and were made prisoner. Bayonets were thrust through the logs. Both forces fought as had their frontier fathers at the stockades. The loss of life was staggering, some of the brigades, wet, bleeding, and decimated, were close to exhaustion. As soon as the attacks on Anderson slackened, Lee called for Humphreys's brigade and for Bratton's and sent them from Anderson's lines to support Ewell. Then Lee determined to make another effort to force the Federals from the parapet of the bloody angle by an advance from Haight's salient. Sending for General Lane, he complimented the conduct of that officer's sharpshooters earlier in the day. He was loath, he said, to send them into action again, but he wished to ascertain the enemy's position on the Fredericksburg Road and would be glad if those fine soldiers would undertake it. Lane replied that however tired the men might be, he knew they would go wherever Lee ordered them. I will not send them unless they are willing to go, Lee answered. When Lane introduced Captain Nicholson, Lee repeated what he had said to Lane. The sharpshooters were at once brought forward and greeted Lee with cheers as they passed him. They soon discovered, however, that the Federals had entrenched positions in front of Early. Two brigades were then thrown out, only to uncover a still stronger line that would bar any large-scale flanking operation from the Confederate right. The possibilities had now been exhausted. The battle had to be fought out at the parapet of the salient until the defenders could be withdrawn to the gorge. Lee directed that the line at that point be completed forthwith, and late in the evening he went there in person to encourage the men. In Ewell's company he walked among the tired troops as they felled trees, carried them into position and piled earth on them. It was 800 yards to the point where the battle was raging. If the line could be completed and occupied safely, there would be little danger of another eruption of the enemy. Long after darkness had engulfed the rear of the salient, the flash of rifles, the roar of the Federal guns, and the appearance of weary, dazed, and bloody men from the front told of the fidelity with which the veterans of the Second Corps were obeying Lee's orders to hold the parapet. They had been fighting now for sixteen hours and more, with no rest, no food. The enemy, still two or three to one, fired ceaselessly through every opening in the parapet or hurled bayonet guns, like spears, down on the heads of the Confederates. The dead were so numerous that they filed the ditch and had to be piled behind it in a ghastly paradox. The survivors waited in mud and gore, slipping now and then over the mangled bodies of their comrades. In all the bloody story of that mad, criminal war there had not been such a hideous ordeal. When it seemed that the remnant of the brigades could not endure even fifteen minutes longer, word would come that they must hold on, that the line at the gorge of the salient was not yet finished. Then, with a grim setting of jaws, they would bite new cartridges, ram home the charges, fire over the parapet and drop back into the muck of the ditch to do the same thing over again, with trembling fingers and numbed arms. At last, about midnight, when the enemy was as weary as they, Lee sent them orders to fall back slowly to the new line. Even then their discipline was perfect. At a whispered command, one unit would slip away, those on either side would close in, and the fire would be kept up. Had old Jack seen them there in the midnight, even his iron countenance would have melted at their misery, but his eyes would have fired in admiration of their valor. It was nearly dawn on the 13th when the last of them passed through the gorge of the salient to new security, but security bought at a ghastly price. Never before, save in the charge of Pickett and Pettigrew at Gettysburg, had as many soldiers of the Army of Northern Virginia been captured as in that salient. Lee did not attempt to give any estimate of their number when he sent a brief report to the president at the end of the day. Ewell subsequently put down the number at 2,000, but the Federals claimed to have taken over 3,000. The casualties among the commanding officers had been terrific. Major General Edward Johnson and Brigadier General George H. Stewart had been captured, Brigadier General Abner Perrin had been killed, Brigadier General Junius Daniel had been mortally wounded, and Brigadier Generals James A. Walker, Samuel McGowan, R. D. Johnston, and S. D. Ramser less seriously injured. In nine days fighting, five general officers had been killed or mortally hurt, nine had been wounded and two had been captured. And this doleful list did not tell the whole story of that dreadful day. 
in the midst of the battle, when the whole army had been wrestling with the blue thousands that had streamed over the parapets, a messenger had arrived with news of Stuart's movements to head off Sheridan's raid before it reached Richmond. Spurring their worn mounts, the anxious southern troopers had intercepted the Federals at Yellow Tavern, seven miles north of Richmond, and had given battle there. Stuart himself, as always, had been in the fullest of the fight, and, just as the Unionists had turned off to try to force a way into Richmond by some less contested route, he had been shot through the body by a dismounted blue cavalryman. That had been on the afternoon of the 11th. The wounded Stuart had been born into Richmond, and, when the dispatch was sent Lee, was believed to be dying. Stuart dying! The eyes of the army about to be destroyed. It was the worst calamity that had befallen the South since that May Day, just a year previously, when Stonewall had breathed his last. Lee was surrounded by a number of young officers when he finished reading the dispatch, and he had to steel himself as he announced the news. General Stewart, he said, as he folded up the paper, has been mortally wounded, a most valuable and able officer. He paused a moment and then he added in a shaken voice, he never brought me a piece of false information. Later in the night, while the battle had still been frenzied, another message brought the dreaded word, with the cheerful composure that had marked all his acts, Stuart had died after 8 p.m. that evening. Lee put his hands over his face to conceal his emotion, as he heard that his great lieutenant was dead, dead in the crisis of his beloved army's life, dead at the age of 31 and before the fullness of his powers had been realized. As quickly as he could, Lee retired to his tent to master his grief, and when one of Stuart's staff officers entered, a little later, to tell him of Stuart's last minutes, Lee could only say, I can scarcely think of him without weeping. To Mrs. Lee he wrote, a more zealous, ardent, brave and devoted soldier than Stuart the Confederacy cannot have. Jackson dead, Stuart dead, Longstreet wounded, Hill sick, Ewell almost incapacitated, the men on whom he had most relied were going fast. He had to walk alone. Still another woe that Black Knight brought. In his raid on Richmond, Sheridan had cut the Richmond, Fredericksburg and Potomac Railroad precisely as, on the 9th, he had torn up track on the Central. The Army's communications with Richmond were thus interrupted. South of Petersburg, on May 7, General Coutts had broken in two places the Petersburg and Weldon Railroad on which both the Commissary and the Quartermaster General relied for the transportation of grain. No supplies were arriving either for the men or for the animals. The wagon trains had several days' short rations of bread and meat. If this gave out, the soldiers could be counted on to tighten their belts and to endure hunger until the railroads could be repaired. But what of the horses? If they were not fed, the guns could not be moved. There seemed no recourse save an uncertain one suggested in a message from the Quartermaster General to appeal to patriotic farmers behind the battlefront to lend the army corn on Lee's personal pledge that it would be repaid promptly in kind. All this load of death, disaster, and threatened hunger was put on Lee's shoulders that dreadful 12th of May, yet he bore it with so stout a heart that even those who knew him best did not realize that in its agonizing demands upon him the day of the bloody angle was second only to the final day at Gettysburg. He did not admit the imminence of ruin or lament the things he could not control. Unafraid, with faith in God, he faced the doubtful morrow. Chapter 19 A Merciful Reign and Another March Spotsylvania, May 1322, 1864. The rain that had drenched the struggling shoulders of the Army of Northern Virginia on the day of the grapple for the bloody angle seemed a mercy on the morning of May 13. It had, to be sure, contributed to prevent the recovery of four of the captured Confederate guns that the enemy was said to have left in the salient on the 12th, but now it gave the weary army rest. As the downpour swelled the streams and filled the roads with water, the outposts could relax, and the men who sat by the fires in the deep woods had assurance that, for the hour at least, their lives were their own. The desperate character of the previous day's fighting was more apparent now that the scene could be surveyed when it was free of smoke and mist. Many amazing stories were told of what had happened, among them that two great forest trees had been hewn down by many balls. Lee was loath to believe this when he heard it from a member of Ewell's staff. Captain, he said to his informant, can you show us those trees? Later on, when the site was accessible, the officer led him to it. One of the trees was an oak with a diameter of 22 inches, chipped away to an unsustaining splinter, as if beavers had gnawed it. 
the other was only two inches smaller across the center. Had not the survivors been nearby in the woods, it would have seemed incredible that men had held their ground in such a fire as felled those trees. The blessed rain continued with a few intermissions until May 17, for full days after the end of the Battle of the Bloody Angle. Large-scale operations were at a standstill. For the soldiers in the ranks, the needed rest was continued, to Lee, rest was a euphemism. He still rose at 3 a.m. daily and, for long hours of toil, was so busy in correcting the confusion caused by the protracted operations that he was glad to snatch a few minutes' sleep on a plank with one end raised on a rail. Consolidating the decimated brigades of Johnson's old division, Lee named John B. Gordon Major General, with rank from the date of his great struggle to recover the bloody angle. Until Lee could decide on a new commander of the Cavalry Corps, for there could be no successor to the unique steward, he directed the separate divisions to report directly to Army headquarters, and because he was well satisfied with the manner in which the divisions of the First Corps were being handled, he requested the cancellation of orders issued by the War Department for the return of Major General McClaws to his old command. Making such temporary arrangements as he could for the brigades whose leaders had been killed or wounded, he exerted himself to keep the morale of the army from weakening under strain. By assuming the blame for the capture of the bloody angle, he avoided all recrimination over the loss of Johnson's division, precisely as he had for the failure at Gettysburg. The cause of the disaster, he said, was the withdrawal of the artillery from the salient, and he was responsible for this because he had permitted himself to be misled by false reports of a new movement on the part of the enemy. Lee taught Hill a most important lesson on May 15, when he shifted Anderson from the left to the right of the line to cover Snell's Bridge, across the pot on the road to Richmond. To secure this position it was necessary to clear a commanding hill in front of the lines. Wright's brigade of the Third Corps was assigned to this task, but was mishandled. Harrison had to be sent in, and some needless casualties had to be sustained before the maneuver to the right could be completed. Lee himself went to the scene and joined General Hill in rear of a nearby church. Hill, who had not yet assumed command, was furious at Wright's blundering tactics and vowed he would have a court of inquiry. In answer to him, without premeditation, Lee made a statement that sums up, more perfectly than any other utterance of his whole career, his theory of handling the untrained officers on whom he was forced so largely to rely, these men are not an army, he said, in his simple, earnest way, they are citizens defending their country. General Wright is not a soldier, he's a lawyer. I cannot do many things that I could do with a trained army. The soldiers know their duties better than the general officers do and they have fought magnificently. Sometimes I would like to mass troops and then deploy them, but if I were to give the proper order, the general officers would not understand it, so I have to make the best of what I have and lose much time in making dispositions. You understand all this, but if you humiliated General Wright, the people of Georgia would not understand. Besides, whom would you put in his place? You'll have to do what I do, when a man makes a mistake, I call him to my tent, talk to him, and use the authority of my position to make him do the right thing the next time. Still again, about this time, during the course of a ride directly in rear of the lines, a six-gun federal battery opened on Lee and the staff officers with him. One shell, striking the ground nearby, ricocheted over the heads of the party. Our horses, Major H. B. McClellan wrote, soon became excited and quickened their pace until it became a gallop. This did not suit General Lee. Traveller was curbed and punished into a walk when the general remarked that he did not wish to have the appearance of being nervous under fire in the presence of his men. In reality, Lee need have had no concern on this score, for the spirit of the men, in the words of General Pendleton, was wonderful. He added, everything is braved and born not only with resolute determination but with the most cheerful good humor. Colonel Taylor admitted that the loss of guns at the bloody angle hurt the pride of the army, but, he hastened to write, we are determined to make our next success all the greater to make amends for this disaster. Our men are in good heart and condition, our confidence, certainly mine, unimpaired. Grant is beating his head against a wall. For himself, Lee could only say, I grieve over the loss of our gallant officers and men, and miss their aid and sympathy. Praise be to God for having sustained us so far. The gaunt spectre of want was repulsed temporarily during these days of rest. 
When the Federal cavalry raids had interrupted communications with the South, Colonel Northrop, grumbling much over the loss of provisions at Beaver Dam, had protested that he could not feed the Army ten days longer unless the railroads were repaired. Lee appealed to the nearby farmers and must have received some help from them, for on the 14th he still had three days' rations on hand. The next morning both the Central and the Richmond, Fredericksburg and Potomac were running normally. The supplies that were now laid down at his advanced bases, Lee distributed in larger quantities to the great satisfaction of the men. As he stopped at a bivouac fire and inquired how the mess was faring, one cheery veteran answered that he feared the army would grow fat and lazy because they were getting two-thirds of a pound of meat daily, though their return during the winter had been only a quarter of a pound. Yet these heartening incidents could not change the gravity of the situation. Casualties to date, though never fully reported, must have been well in excess of 15,000 and not a single regiment had arrived, except Johnston's brigade on May 6 to make good the losses. General Grant was believed to be receiving large reinforcements. If the Army of Northern Virginia was to continue to stand between the Federals and Richmond, it must be strengthened. But how and whence? Lee had read on the 12th that the X and 18 Union Corps had been recalled from the South Atlantic seaboard and had been sent to Butler, and he had asked the President if Confederate troops could not be brought from that territory. Mr. Davis had answered regretfully that he had already stripped the coast states and knew of no organized units from which he could draw, except perhaps a few in Florida. There were 14 brigades, large and small, in the defenses of Richmond, Drury's Bluff, and Petersburg, with one brigade of cavalry and an abundance of artillery, but Sheridan's cavalry was just below Malvern Hill, undefeated, Butler was pressing on toward Drury's Bluff from the south side of the James, and Coutts's cavalry was now on a raid against the Richmond and Danville Railroad. Breckinridge had two brigades and on battalion of infantry in the Valley of Virginia and had called to him the Cadet Corps of the Virginia Military Institute, which Lee had held for just such an emergency. All that Lee thought he could get at the time was Hoke's old brigade, which had reached the Richmond line from North Carolina, and even this was denied him for the moment. President Davis, whose courage was never higher and whose head was never clearer than in this dark crisis, did not believe it was safe to release any troops from around Richmond until Beauregard had launched against Butler an attack that Davis and Bragg were urging him to deliver. General Beauregard, for his part, was developing a succession of sketchy plans whereby Lee should withdraw to the Chickahominy and reinforce him in routing Butler, after which happy consummation Beauregard's army was to join with Lee's in crushing Grant. The administration did not look with favor on these proposals and, so far as the records show, did not present them in detail for Lee's consideration. I dare not promise anything now, Davis told Lee. If possible, I will sustain you in your unequal struggle, so long and nobly maintained. He suggested that Lee summon to him the troops in the Shenandoah Valley, but Lee considered this too risky. With a single protest against the detachment of any cavalry, Lee accepted the inevitable and continued to face Grant with his diminished forces. On the 14th, while the rain was still falling and the roads were almost beyond travel by the most venturesome, the Union forces evacuated the tip of the bloody angle. That day and the next and on the 16th there were confused movements and feints on the enemy's part, with a suggestion that Grant was preparing to move southward, but with no renewal of the general offensive. Lee was concerned, almost depressed, at his inability to ascertain the inwardness of these maneuvers. Ah, Major, he said to H. B. McClellan, who had been Assistant Adjutant General of the Cavalry Corps, if my poor friend Stuart were here I should know all about what those people are doing. Then, perhaps unexpectedly, there came the sunshine of good news almost at the very time the clouds broke away in brighter weather. On the 15th, at New Market, Breckinridge met Siegel and with the assistance of the battalion from the Virginia Military Institute, which fought with a valor that would have added luster to St. Cyr, he drove the invaders down the valley. It was a rout reminiscent of Jackson's operations of two years previously. Lee was immensely pleased that the upper valley was cleared and that, at a single blow, one of the most serious threats against his flank had been relieved. He hastened to send his congratulations to Breckinridge and urged him to pursue the enemy into Maryland, or, if that was not practicable, to join the Army of Northern Virginia at once. An advance into Maryland he considered more fruitful of potential results, but if that was beyond Breckinridge's strength, then he hoped to have at least temporary reinforcement by two brigades of infantry. 
Scarcely had the soldiers realized the importance of the success in the valley than the Telegraph and the Richmond newspapers 38 reported an even finer victory. On the 16th, Beauregard attacked Butler below Drury's Bluff and hurled him back to Bermuda Hundred Neck, where, in General Grant's expressive phrase, he was as completely shut off from further operations directly against Richmond as if he had been in a bottle strongly corked. This created a situation that was to play so large a part in subsequent operations that it is sketched on page 336. Butler's predicament is readily seen. So long as he remained in Bermuda Neck, while Beauregard's line was a cork, his powers of doing mischief were small. More than that, as the mouth of the bottle was only four miles wide, a very small force of infantry, supported by ample artillery, would suffice to hold him there. Lee, being confident of this, at once asked that some of Beauregard's troops be sent to him. He saw in Butler's distress the one opportunity, in all the Southland, of giving his army substantial reinforcements. Almost simultaneously with the news of Beauregard's success came reports that Sheridan's raid against Richmond had ended, that Coutts had given up his attacks on the Richmond and Danville Railroad, and that Crook and Avril had started back into western Virginia from their operations against the Virginia and Tennessee. As if by a miracle, the widespread offensives that had attended the opening of the campaign had resolved themselves into the major thrust of Grant against Richmond, with the bottled butler a continuing nuisance but not an immediate danger. Finally, on the 18th, as if to give a final dramatic climax to the changed situation, an attempted general assault through the bloody angle was broken up so quickly and so easily that the army scarcely realized General Grant had planned another 12th of May. Relieved though he was by the repulse of this assault and by the failure of all the minor offensives in Virginia, Lee was not for a moment misled as to the magnitude of the danger that still confronted him. He knew, by the evening of the 18th, that Breckinridge had decided against an advance down the Shenandoah Valley and was preparing to entrain for Hanover Junction with 2,400 infantry, but he had as yet no assurance that any of the troops from the Richmond Drury's bluff line would be sent him. In a lengthy confidential dispatch to the president on the 18th, Lee thus summarized his view of the situation, Grant's position is strongly entrenched, and we cannot attack it with any prospect of success without great loss of men which I wish to avoid if possible. The enemy's artillery is superior in weight of metal and range to our own, and my object has been to engage him when in motion and under circumstances that will not cause us to suffer from this disadvantage. I think by this means he has suffered considerably in the several past combats, and that his progress has thus far been arrested. I shall continue to strike him wherever opportunity presents itself, but nothing at present indicates any purpose on his part to advance. Neither the strength of our army nor the condition of our animals will admit of any extensive movement with a view to drawing the enemy from his position. I think he is now waiting for reinforcements. Other reports represent that General Grant has been assured that he shall have all that he requires. The importance of this campaign to the administration of Mr. Lincoln and to General Grant leaves no doubt that every effort and every sacrifice will be made to secure its success. A Washington telegram states that it is reported that the 10th and 18th Army Corps now south of the James will be called to General Grant as they are not strong enough to take Richmond and too strong to be kept idle. The recent success of General Beauregard may induce the fulfillment of this report if the idea was not previously entertained. It is also stated that the troops from General Sheridan's department under General Smith have been ordered back, it may be to join GNL Sheridan or to be brought east. The defensive position of GNL Johnston, which I doubt not is justified by his situation, may enable the enemy to detach a portion of the force opposed to him for service here. I trust that no effort will be spared to prevent this, or should it occur, to give timely notice of it. From all these sources General Grant can, and if permitted will repair the losses of the late battles, and be as strong as when he began operation. I deem it my duty to present the actual, and what I consider the probable situation of affairs to Your Excellency, in order that your judgment may be guided in devising the means of opposing the force that is being arrayed against us. I doubt not that you will be able to suggest the best means to be taken, and that all the emergency calls for will be done as far as it is in your power." Later in the day, Lee summarized these representations by telegraph and again gave the warning that more than once had induced the president to send him troops even when Richmond had seemed to be threatened. The question, he said, is whether we shall fight the battle here or around Richmond. If the troops are obliged to be retained at Richmond I may be forced back. 
Abundant evidence with forthcoming on May 19 of the determination Lee credited in these dispatches to his stubborn adversary. On the Confederate right the enemy seemed as strong as ever, but on the left, which Ewell had held alone since Anderson had been shifted on the 1415, there were indications that the enemy might be withdrawing. This suggested the possibility that the Union troops opposite the Confederate left were being moved to the other flank. The turning movement that Lee had been suspecting since May 15 might have underway. To ascertain the facts, Lee ordered Ewell to demonstrate during the afternoon in front of his lines, but Ewell asked to be allowed to undertake a circuitous maneuver that would put him in rear of the federal right flank. Lee gave the permission and, as usual, left the details to Ewell. Not long after the Second Corps had started, Lee found to his consternation that Ewell had sent back his artillery because of the badness of the roads. Realizing that this was inviting disaster, Lee sought to extend Early's left to cover Ewell's front. Very soon rapid firing announced that Ewell had encountered the foe. As his object was merely to discover whether Grant had abandoned that part of the front, Ewell prepared to withdraw, but before he could do so the Federals attacked him with much vigor. Happily, General Hampton, who had screened Ewell's operation, had carried a battery of his horse artillery along with him, and he quickly disposed this to check the enemy. The onrush of the Federals was, however, so vigorous that General Ramser became fearful that Ewell's 6,000 would be routed. Without waiting for orders, he delivered a vigorous counterattack with his brigade. When forced to suspend this, because both his flanks were in danger of envelopment, Ramser fell back some 200 yards. In a short time, the troops on the left of Rhodes's division gave way, and Ramser had to retire to the position from which he had started his counteroffensive. Their Pegram's brigade came up on his left and rectified the line, which Ramser was able to hold until nightfall. The corps then returned as it had come, and without molestation, but it left about 900 killed, wounded, and missing in the enemy's lines, a heavy price to pay for the information that the enemy had not denuded his right. The affair was badly managed except for the gallant action of Ramsar and Pegram, and it probably raised anew in the mind of General Lee a doubt as to the physical ability of General Ewell to handle his troops when quick decision and prompt action were required in the face of a vigilant, aggressive foe. Grant, in any case, had not moved. That was the situation at dark on the 19th. Whether he had slipped away during the night, or would march the next day, or would use his reinforcements for a new attack on the Spotsylvania line, was still undetermined on the morning of May 20. There was, however, encouragement for Lee in a telegram received from Mr. Davis early in the day. The president announced that he had ordered Pickett's division and Hoke's brigade to march to Lee, though Beauregard was loath to give up the troops and was still contending that Lee should fall back to the line of the Chickahominy for a better concentration of the defending forces. Wherever and whenever Grant moved, Lee would have five more brigades to employ against him. I am fully alive, he telegraphed the president to the importance of concentration and being near base. The latter consideration may impel me to fall back eventually. Will do so at once if deemed best. My letters gave you my views. The troops promised will be advantageous in either event. I have posted Breckenridge at Hanover Junction to guard communication whence he can speedily return to Valley if necessary. Scarcely had this message been dispatched than signs multiplied of an impending southward movement by the Federals. Lee at once transferred the Texas Brigade to the south of the Put to protect some guns he placed there to cover the crossing, and when he advised Ewell of the indications of a Federal shift, he urged him to strike the enemy's rear if he found an opening. This was in accordance with the broad strategic policy Lee had kept in mind since the beginning of the campaign, to resume the offensive if he could catch the enemy in motion. By evening, he was so well satisfied Grant was changing position that he told General Ewell to move to the right at daylight the next morning unless some good reason developed for not doing so. Before 9 a.m. on May 21, General Lee knew that the enemy was moving toward Bowling Green and Milford. He had already concluded that Grant's new base would be at Port Royal, on the Rappahannock River, and he now had Ewell's corps in position along the Puh, prepared to move at the tap of a drum. The rest of the army was made ready to leave the Spotsylvania lines as soon as the Federals disappeared from in front of Early and of Anderson, who held the left and the center, respectively, after Ewell moved from the vicinity of the Bloody Angle. But where should the army seek to interpose itself between Grant and Richmond? That was the question Lee had to answer. 
Obviously the enemy had the lead, how much of a lead, it was impossible for Confederate headquarters to say with assurance, though the cavalry was sending in reports through the signal stations every 15 minutes. Obviously, too, Grant would make for Richmond as fast as he could, and he must be met as far from the city as possible. A siege of the capital must, if possible, be avoided. For the moment, that part of the Federal host moving by way of Bowling Green was behind the Mattapony, safe from attack. If Grant kept beyond that river for any considerable distance, Lee realized that he might not be able to meet him again until the Army of the Potomac was south of the Pamunkey. The reason for this was purely geographical and will be apparent from the sketch of the course of the two rivers shown on the next page. The advance on Richmond, in short, might readily be from the northeast, especially as the federal command of the sea made it possible for Grant to establish a base at any point on any of the rivers to the very head of navigation. At the same time, one federal column was certainly on the Milford Road, whence it could move to attack Richmond from the north via Hanover Junction and, in doing so, could sever communication with the valley by seizing the Central Railroad. Which would it be, an advance from the northeast or from the north? Lee could not say, as yet, but he decided very quickly to move back to the North Anna River. If the enemy struck from the north, he would have a river line from which to defend Hanover Junction and the Central Railroad. In case the enemy continued down the Mattapony, the Army of Northern Virginia could easily move from the North Anna to a new position behind the Pamunkey. There was but one objection to making his stand on the North Anna, it was only 23 miles from Richmond, dangerously close. Lee would have preferred to bring north of the river the troops at Hanover Junction and to give battle as far from Richmond as possible. But he reasoned that if he tried to operate between Spotsylvania and the North Anna, or followed the enemy eastward, some part of Grant's force might slip by and get between him and Richmond. The North Anna was the nearest position of strength that he could take up and be sure that his adversary would not easily slip around his flank. His solicitude for Richmond, rather than his wishes, shaped his strategy. Hanover Junction it was, then. He telegraphed instructions for the waiting troops to remain there and to defend the place against raiders. The wagon trains he started southward by roads west of those on which the army was to move. Not long after noon, Ewell was put in motion for Mud Tavern and the Telegraph Road, on the way to the junction. Orders were given General Early to sweep his front and, if he found that the enemy had departed, to prepare to march. Similar directions went to field. Lee himself moved his headquarters to the Southworth House, on the right bank of the Pa, and there he remained, somewhat impatiently, to hear the outcome of the reconnaissance north of that river. While he waited, General Hill rode up and reported. Prompted no doubt by the feeling that he should not place upon another the responsibility of directing his corps in a new and perhaps critical movement, he informed his chief that he was well enough to take up his duties again. Lee at once restored him to command and ordered Early to resume the leadership of his division under Ewell. Early was of opinion that only skirmishers were in his front, but they resisted so vigorously a reconnaissance by General Wilcox that two brigades were sent after them and were soon engaged in a stiff fight. A very violent storm came up as the action progressed, but it did not halt Wilcox's veterans, who advanced some distance. Field, too, encountered some opposition on his sector. He was so slow in getting away that he provoked a sharp message from Lee, unless we can drive those people out, or find out whether they are all gone, Lee wrote Anderson, we are detained here to our disadvantage. Soon, however, Anderson was convinced that only a rear guard remained on the line, and he followed Ewell. As the evening drew on, several of Lee's general officers joined him at the Southworth House for instructions. Hill was there, and early. Anderson lingered for a while, and Rooney Lee came up. To all of them, Lee gave his final verbal orders. He told Hill to withdraw his last units at 9 p.m. from the bloody Spotsylvania line, unless the enemy left before that time. The Third Corps was then to move by roads west of and parallel to the route Ewell and Anderson were to pursue. When Early asked if he should guard the right bank of the Mattapony, Lee informed him that Hancock had been at Milford since morning, that he had possession of the hills on the south side of the river, and that he had fortified them. One by one, their orders understood, the officers rode off. Lee remained alone with his staff and a few guides who had been assigned him that day by reason of their familiarity with the roads of the nearby counties. 
Presently, with no more ceremony than if he were departing for an evening ride, Lee said to his companions, Come, gentlemen. Mounting silently, he touched the reins of Traveller and turned his head southward. The great battles of Spotsylvania were now at an end. How many they had been, and how desperate! Each year of the war, from the time Lee had taken command of the Army of Northern Virginia, the course of the conflict had brought him into Spotsylvania, and not once had he been defeated there. In Fredericksburg stood the wall from which the incautious Burnside had been bloodily repulsed, across the county ran the narrow, mysterious roads over which the Second Corps had hurried to the flank of Hooker's host, in a shell-torn thicket, no stone marked the spot where Jackson had fallen. Still bare in the woods near Hamilton's Crossing was the site on which Lee had planned the invasion of Pennsylvania. But never again were the thickets to echo the wild rebel yell. To the thousands of shallow graves in the forests none were to be added. The barricades might rot and the trenches wash away. The trumpet vine might climb the gaunt, scarred trees and the honeysuckle cover the ruin of the shell-swept homes. Spotsylvania's sacrifices were complete no more was to be exacted of her. The fields and the forests that had witnessed the high noon of the Confederacy were to be spared the night of a waning cause. Chapter 20, A Vain Invitation to Attack The North Anna, May 2227, 1864 With young Ned Curry by his side as a guide, and with Colonel Taylor and W. G. Jesse, another guide, immediately behind, Lee rode through the night toward Traveler's Rest, midway between the Panta Rivers. He had little to say, but he inquired the names of his youthful companions and reassured himself as to their knowledge of the roads. When they reached Traveler's Rest, they turned to their left and came into the Telegraph Road at a humble place bearing the unophonious name of Mud Tavern. Here Moncurry remarked that some of the enemy were a mile farther to the eastward, on the road to Guinea Station. How do you know? asked Lee. When Moncurry explained that his cavalry command had been there about noon and had been forced back, Lee halted for a moment and told Colonel Taylor to instruct General Anderson to send a regiment down the road toward Guineas to protect the passing column. Riding on, he soon overtook the artillery of Ewell's corps, where the weary drivers were hurrying the weak horses onward through the mud. Ere long he came in the darkness to the crossing of the Ta River at Gerald's Mill. Half a mile beyond the river he rode into a jam of broken wagons, crowded guns, and swearing soldiers. Lee wormed his way through them, speaking to the officers and men as he passed and giving instructions for clearing the road. The soldiers could not see him but they seemed to sense who he was, and, in a few minutes, they had the wheels turning again. Pressing on, Lee and his little cavalcade reached the junction of the Bethany, Welches, and Bowling Green roads. For the second time, Moncurry spoke up to warn his commander that the enemy were only a mile away to the eastward. As before, Lee asked why he knew, and again Moncurry answered that he had been there on a reconnaissance that afternoon. Lee had Taylor leave a courier at the crossroads to instruct Anderson, upon arrival, to protect his flank. Having covered fifteen miles, Lee was on the rear of Ewell's infantry, who were struggling on through the darkness toward Hanover Junction. By the roadside stragglers were encountered, some of them asleep and some of them resting, before they set out to overtake their commands. In characteristic tone, Lee addressed them, I know you do not want to be taken prisoner, he said, and I know you are tired and sleepy, but the enemy will be along before or by daybreak and if you do not move on you will be taken. There was grumbling from the roadside and a few tart answers from soldiers who were safe from identification in the blackness of the night. Well you may order us to move on, move on, one of them retorted, when you are mounted on a horse and have all the rations that the country can afford. Lee made no answer and needed to make none, for some of the men nearest to him peered into his face, half suspecting who he was. Moss Robert, they exclaimed. The effect was instantaneous. The soldiers got up as if they had never known weariness and gave him a shout. Yes, Moss Robert, they said, we'll move on and go anywhere you say, even to hell. Thanking them and bidding them good speed, Lee trotted on and about 2 a.m. on the morning of the 22d came to the quaint little house by the roadside, whence Dr. Joseph A. a Flippo ministered to the ills of the countryside. A light was burning in the house, for the good doctor sought no sleep that night, with the army tramping by and the enemy likely to come up when the last grey brigade had passed. Lee paused to rest his mount and to chat with Flippo, and then went on once more. 
When he reached the north side of Stevens Mill Pond, for miles north of Mount Carmel Church, he found his headquarters tents erected, with Ewell's troops resting nearby. Here he halted, but before he went to his own cot, which the faithful Brian had set up for him, he inquired if his young guides had any rations. Moncurry hesitated to answer, for he did not wish to impose on the general's scanty larder, though he and his companion were quite without provisions. Guessing the reason for the soldier's embarrassment, Lee told him and Jesse to tie their horses, to get some feed from the nearest quartermaster, and then to go into his headquarters tent and eat. If the men had visions of a hearty early morning breakfast of substantials, they were soon disappointed, for when they presented themselves, all Brian could give them was two very bad biscuits each and a cup of coffee that was a satire on the name. Lee rested for an hour or two and then, before dawn, summoned Moncurry and sent him off with an open dispatch to General Hampton, advising him of the army's progress and instructing him to hold the enemy in check and to fall back slowly toward Hanover Junction. The troops of the II Corps were now stirring. They had covered the 17 miles to Dickinson's Mill almost without a halt, and they had relaxed only an hour or two, but they must reach the North Anna before the enemy, and to do that they must press on. The first news that reached Lee, as he prepared to ride on with the van of the Corps, was that Hoke's unattached brigade and Barton's brigade of Pickett's division were at hand, and that Corses and Kemper's, also of Pickett's division, had reached the vicinity of Milford the previous evening. For brigades, and with Breckenridge's two, a total of a division and a half. Approximately a third of the wastage of the campaign had been repaired. In announcing to the president the arrival of these troops, Lee had his first opportunity of explaining his withdrawal from Spotsylvania. He said, In a wooded country like that in which we have been operating, where nothing is known beyond what can be ascertained by feeling, a day's march can always be gained. I should have preferred contesting the enemy's approach inch by inch, but my solicitude for Richmond caused me to abandon that plan. Proceeding with the troops, Lee was soon joined by Major Jed Hotchkiss, the capable topographical engineer of the II Corps. Together, they talked of the battles of Spotsylvania and of the struggle for the bloody angle. We wish no more salience, Lee remarked grimly. Soon they reached the hills that looked down on the crossings of the North Anna. The railroad bridge to the left and Fox's bridge on the telegraph road were both intact. A small Confederate garrison held the works that had been erected to protect the wooden spans. The race to the new position had been won. If Grant was headed in that direction, he would find the stream between him and the Army of Northern Virginia. Lee left orders for Ewell and Anderson to pass to the south bank and to take position there, without destroying the spans or evacuating the bridgeheads. With his staff he went on to Hanover Junction, three miles southward, and there he established headquarters in the southwest angle of the crossing of the Richmond, Fredericksburg and Potomac and Central Railroads. At 9.30 a.m. he had the satisfaction of telegraphing to the Secretary of War that the Second Corps was arriving, that the first was close up, and that Hill was expected to come in on the right. The day was hot, but the breeze was pleasant, and as the troops came up they were loosely disposed in the fields on the south bank, Ewell on the right and Anderson opposite the bridges. It was the first time since May 4 that the army had not been in sight of the main body of the enemy. The afternoon of the 22d passed without the appearance of any federal force on the north side of the river, but Hampton reported that the Army of the Potomac was marching by Milford and that its objective seemed to be Hanover Junction. Lee hoped that it was. Now that he had occupied the junction, he felt himself in position to move after Grant, whatever his adversary's line of march. He was anxious for Beauregard to join him, if possible, for an attack on the Army of the Potomac, because, as he wrote President Davis, it seems to me our best policy to unite upon, Grant's army, and endeavor to crush it. At the same time, he did not think it sound strategy to permit the enemy to reach the Chickahominy before the Army of Northern Virginia was reinforced by Beauregard. It was as easy, he thought, to assail Grant after he had crossed the Pamunkey as to take the offensive on the Chickahominy. His difficulties, he said of Grant, will be increased as he advances, and ours diminished, and I think it would be a great disadvantage to us to uncover our railroads to the west, and injurious to open to him more country than we can avoid. In short, if he could meet Grant where the larger numbers and the superior artillery of the enemy did not make the offensive hopeless, it was still his intention to attack, and as far from Richmond as practicable. 
Perhaps he recalled, as he planned, Napoleon's memorable analysis of just such a problem as confronted him then. Maneuver incessantly, Napoleon had said, without submitting to be driven back on the capital which it is meant to defend or shut up in an entrenched camp in the rear. Carefully, on the morning of May 23, Lee reconnoitered the ground on the south side of the river, opposite the bridges. He did not fortify extensively, probably because he did not believe the enemy would attack, or because he wished to keep contact with the north bank as he had at Rappahannock, or else because he knew he could not long retain a position close to the river, inasmuch as the south bank was dominated by the high ground on the north side of the stream. The army, however, was where it could maneuver on either flank. Ewell was continued on the right, Anderson was left where he was, and Hill, who reached Hewlett's on the Central Railroad at noon on the 22d, was moved down the railroad to Anderson Station and was bivouacked in the woods nearby. The Confederate cavalry outposts withdrew and bluecoats began to appear on the left bank of the North Anna about noon on the 23d. Soon it was apparent that the enemy was moving up in great force, probably with his entire army. Once again Lee had reason rightly concerning his opponent's objective, once again the Army of the Potomac had marched straight to a wall of waiting bayonets. Lee made ready for whatever might come, but he did not recall the small Confederate commands remaining in the bridgeheads, as it was believed the southern batteries could protect them until it was apparent whether Lee would have need of the bridges, in case the enemy moved up or down the north bank of the river. Ere long the enemy's artillery opened against the bridgeheads, and the Confederates answered. General Lee happened at the time to be in the yard of Ellington, the home of the Fox family, overlooking the river. The owner, W. E. Fox, came up and invited the general into the house. Lee thanked him and said that he would be there only a few minutes. Mr. Fox thereupon pressed him to take some refreshment. Again the general declined, but seeing that Mr. Fox's hospitality was offended, he added that if Mr. Fox had any buttermilk, he would be glad to have a glass. Mr. Fox insisted that the general take a seat on the porch, and hurried off to bring the milk and some stale bread, which was all he had. He brought the pitcher and the plate and set them before Lee. The general poured out the milk and was in the act of drinking it when a federal battery, whose commander evidently had seen a uniform on the porch, fired a round shot. It passed within a few feet of the general and embedded itself in the doorframe, where the marks may be seen to this day. To Mr. Fox's amazement, the general finished his milk as if nothing had happened, thanked his host and then rode quickly away, lest his presence provoke a bombardment of the house. Opposite the railroad crossing and Fox's bridge there now were signs of federal activity in ravines that could not be reached by the southern guns. Nearly two miles upstream, at Oxford, Union troops gathered in large numbers but made no attempt to cross. From a point beyond the left of the position a P. Hill had occupied, there had come the sound of artillery firing which had caused some excitement at Corps headquarters. To ascertain the situation there, Lee determined to make personal reconnaissance, and as he felt weary and unwell, he procured a carriage and rode westward. He found some of the horse artillery in position with cavalry support, throwing up a light fortification of fence rails. Across the North Anna, on the skirt of a wood, the Federals were visible. Lee took out his glass and studied them carefully. Then he turned to the courier who had accompanied him. Go back and tell General A. P. Hill to leave his men in camp, he said, this is nothing but a feint, the enemy is preparing to cross below. He had scarcely returned to Hanover Junction before his prediction was fulfilled. General Wilcox, under orders from General Hill, had gone forward to examine the ground somewhat east of the artillery position where Lee had been. There was a bend in the river at this point, opposite Jericho Mills, which was three miles above Oxford. About three o'clock General Wilcox found that the enemy had crossed at the mill and was advancing southward through a densely wooded country. He galloped back and reported to General Hill, who at once ordered him to advance his division and to attack. Moving up the road directly south of the Central Railroad and parallel to it, General Wilcox formed his line opposite Noel's station, with Lane on the right, McGowan on the left of Lane, and Thomas on the left of McGowan. Scales's brigade was placed in rear of Thomas, with instructions to march around Thomas's left and to assail the enemy in flank and rear if it should be found that Thomas's flank extended beyond that of the enemy. Lane and McGowan had to advance over open ground, down to a boggy little stream, and then upward to a thick wood, where the enemy was believed to be. 
Thomas's advance from the first was to be through the woods. The action opened briskly. Lane and McGowan reached the forest in their front and swept into it. Thomas quickly drove the enemy backward. In a short time, however, Thomas gave way at the very moment that the enemy in his front did the same thing. McGowan's left was thrown in the air on Thomas's withdrawal and a gap was created. One of Lane's regiments broke twice, but the remaining three pressed on. Scales's brigade found the enemy's flank but for some reason did not press it. By nightfall the division was glad to withdraw, in the unhappy knowledge that the troops in its front, which proved to be the V-Corps of Warren, were still on the south bank and were entrenching rapidly. It was a badly managed affair, and no credit either to Hill or to Wilcox. Haight's division had been brought up during the afternoon but had not been successful in driving the enemy. The action on Hill's front might mean that the enemy was preparing to cross the North Anna with his entire army, for Grant would hardly have thrown so large a force to the south side simply to feel out the Confederates. On the opposite flank, about 7.15 p.m., in the midst of a furious rainstorm, there was another move that might indicate a determination on Grant's part to force a crossing. From the ravines beyond the bridgeheads, the enemy swarmed forward and overwhelmed the small garrison. Between 100 and 200 men, who could not run the gauntlet over the bridges in the gathering darkness, were captured. Was all this a ruse? On the theory that it might be, Lee directed Anderson, at the end of the day, to pack his wagons and to be ready if necessary to move the next morning. To prepare for the larger probability of an attack by the enemy on the front where the Army of Northern Virginia then stood, Lee decided to change his lines. He could not keep the enemy from moving to the south side opposite the bridges, for after he burned these the enemy could easily ford the river where the water was then low. Neither could Lee fight close to the river on his right because the Federal guns, already in battery on the higher ground on the north bank, dominated the position he occupied. If, then, the Federals could cross opposite his right, as they already had opposite his left, they might hope to turn either flank or both. But there was one point where the ground favored Lee. That was in the center, near Oxford. There the Confederates held the elevation and could prevent a Federal crossing. Lee accordingly determined on a novel system of defenses. He drew back Ewell and the right of Anderson to the southeast, he kept the left of Anderson opposite Oxford, and he directed that as soon as Hill's men were rested, they were to run a line from Oxford southwestward to Little River. Thus Lee would have his front a very wide inverted V with its apex to the north and both flanks well secured, the left by Little River and the right by swampy ground east of Hanover Junction. As Henderson well phrased it, Lee shut up his line like one closes an umbrella, as the sketch shows. He was now in position where he could easily reinforce one wing from the other, and as long as he held Oxford he could compel Grant to fight with his wings separated. Thus favorably situated, Lee was sanguine. His communications were shorter, and his strength was raised, at last, some 8,500 by the arrival of all of Pickett's division, Hook's old brigade, and Breckinridge's command. The opportunity for which he had been waiting might come the very next day. But before it developed, Lee was attacked by a violent intestinal complaint, brought on, no doubt, by bad food and long hours. He was loath, as always, to yield to sickness, and on the 24th he tried to transact army business as usual. Early in the day he rode over to the left flank and learned the details of Hill's failure the previous evening. Morning reports showed that in Wilcox's division alone the casualties had been 642, entirely too many men to be lost to no purpose. Lee's temper was least under control in his rare periods of sickness, and when he saw General Hill he is said to have asked him abruptly, why did you not do as Jackson would have done, thrown your whole force upon these people and driven them back? There was no answer to the question, and no remedy for the situation that had developed on that flank, except to put Hill to work digging his part of the V-line, in the hope that the enemy might make some blunder and offer an opening. The Federals on that sector, however, took no chances. While Hill's men dug, they too threw up dirt, and soon had a line which crossed the Central Railroad two-thirds of a mile northwest of Anderson Station. This, of course, meant that communications with Staunton would once more be interrupted and that a part of the track of the Virginia Central would be torn up again. On the right, opposite the bridges, the Union forces crossed to the south bank as soon as they discovered that the Confederates had drawn in their lines. 
This put the enemy precisely where Lee wanted him. If Grant tried to reinforce the right from the left, or vice versa, he would have to cross the river twice. The Confederate center held stubbornly to Oxford. An attempt by Grant to force a crossing at that point and to connect the Federal left and right in a continuous line south of the river was easily defeated. For a few hours opportunity beckoned, and if Lee had been well enough to organize a strong and immediate attack on either flank, he might perhaps have crushed the two corps on his right or the V on his left, but hourly, as the Union entrenchments rose, his chances of success grew less. Lee was worse on the 25th and confined to his tent, but he insisted on receiving reports and he carried on his official correspondence, in which there was not even a hint that he was sick. Some of his staff were disposed to think that he should not have vexed himself with duty when he was almost incapacitated. But what could he do? Beauregard's hands were full at Bermuda Hundred, and to whom else could he turn over the command? To Ewell, senior corps chief, who was himself scarcely able to keep the field. To Hill, who had just failed on the left. To Anderson, who had been in corps command scarcely more than a fortnight. As long as he was able to direct operations, Lee had no alternative. He must endure the pain and the debilitating symptoms. In his dispatches he was able to keep his measured tone. Writing to the president of the heavy reinforcement of Grant, he again urged joint operations by his army and Beauregard's, and at whatever point most advantageous to Beauregard. His phrases were as considerate and as self-controlled as if he had been at his best. In his tent, it was different. As he felt opportunity slipping away, his grip on himself weakened, and he had a violent scene with Colonel Venable, who argued some point with him. When Venable emerged from the general's tent, he was, Major McClellan remembered, in a state of flurry and excitement, full to bursting, and he blurted out, I have just told the old man that he is not fit to command this army, and that he had better send for Beauregard. Lee could not, would not give up, but he broke out vehemently, we must strike them a blow, we must never let them pass us again, we must strike them a blow. To Dr. Gwathmi, he said of Grant, if I can get one more pull at him, I will defeat him. The opportunity was gone, however. The Unionists were too strong to be attacked and too cautious to assault the lines with their forces divided. The 25th passed with nothing more serious than a few demonstrations. To procure more rest than was possible at Hanover Junction, Lee moved his headquarters three miles down the Richmond, Fredericksburg and Potomac Railroad to Taylorsville. He had the satisfaction of knowing that the troops were rested and that their morale was still high. No concern whatever did he have as to their willingness and ability to fight, but he dreaded the numerical superiority of the enemy, particularly in the cavalry. The Federals did not wait long in the difficult position where Lee had placed them by drawing his inverted V. On the 26th there were heavy demonstrations along the river and reports that the enemy was moving up the left bank. Lee ordered the enemy's lines felt out, and he began to suspect that instead of sliding his left flank southward, Grant might be preparing to move on Richmond by the Union right flank. This suspicion was disproved at dawn on the morning of May 27. The enemy was found to have evacuated the south bank of the North Anna and was marching down the north bank. Grant had declined the challenge to battle and was preparing to try again. Almost at the same time, cavalry outposts that Lee had prudently placed far on his right reported that the Federals were crossing at Hanover Town on the Pamunkey River. The Pamunkey is formed by the junction of the North and South Anna Rivers, and its course is from northwest to southwest. When Grant started down the North Anna for the Pamunkey he had the cover of a river and, at the same time, was getting eight miles nearer Richmond, for the distance from Richmond to the North Anna is about 23 miles north to south, while Hanover Town is 15 miles by air northeast from the Confederate capital. General Lee must have had the possibility of this maneuver in mind when he wrote on May 21 that he doubted if he could strike Grant until after the Union Army had passed the Pamunkey. He did not waste an hour now in hurrying to intercept his adversary in this new effort to reach Richmond. Ewell's corps was immediately set in motion down the Richmond, Fredericksburg and Potomac Railroad toward Ashland, and Anderson, with Breckinridge, was ordered to follow him. Hill was to form the rear guard and was to leave the North Anna that evening. The operation on the North Anna was not accounted a success because it did not compel Grant to give battle. Strategically, it accomplished far more than Lee could then foresee. 
It forced the federal commander to abandon a direct movement on Richmond from the north, and that, as the event proved, was to leave Lee in command of communications with the Valley of the Shenandoah. This, in turn, not only gave him an opportunity for offensive operations there but assured him such supplies as Western Virginia could yield. No achievement of the entire campaign from the Rapidan to the James meant more in prolonging the struggle. Five months later Meade was to write of the Virginia Central, until that road is destroyed, we cannot compel the evacuation of Richmond. But now Lee saw the battle brought back, close to the fields where he had taken command not quite two years previously. Two years only. It seemed an aeon of anxiety. Chapter 21, Maneuver on the Totopotomoy. May 2730, 1864. Past scattered farmhouses, where the women waved their handkerchiefs as bravely as when every march had been northward, Lee rode with Ewell's corps toward Richmond on the morning of May 27. He made good speed, for the Second Corps could always outmarch any other large unit in the Army of Northern Virginia. About midday he learned from the cavalry that the enemy seemed to be advancing from Hanover Town on the Pamunkey to Hosshop, an important crossroads ten miles northeast of Mechanicsville on the way to Richmond. This was of course familiar terrain to Lee. He remembered that there was a fine defensive position on the ridge between Totopotomoy and Beaver Dam Creeks, the same ridge he had ordered Stuart to reconnoiter at the beginning of the famous ride around McClellan. The columns were ordered in that direction, to intercept Grant and, if might be, to give him battle there. Continuing down the Telegraph Road, Lee came in the afternoon to the vicinity of the Chickahominy River, just west of the upper waters of the Totopotomoy. There he received reports that only cavalry had been seen in the vicinity of Hosshop and that a column of infantry was vaguely said to be moving along the south bank of the Pamunkey from Hanover Courthouse to Hanover Town. This information was much too indefinite to justify Lee in throwing the whole army to the northeast of Richmond, for this would leave open to the enemy the direct road from the north, via Ashland. Consequently, Lee decided to halt the columns for the night north and northwest of Atlee so that they could be moved in whichever direction the advance of the enemy might develop. Lee opened his headquarters at the Jenkins House, a few hundred yards from the Telegraph Road, near the point where the road to Atlee's leaves the main highway. The Second Corps was immediately to the eastward and southeastward. General Ewell established himself slightly more than a mile east of Lee at Satterwhite's. The leader of the Second Corps had been suffering, like his chief, from an intestinal malady, had ridden all day in an ambulance, and by evening was so ill that he had to turn over the command of the troops temporarily to General Early, who was at the nearby Hughes House. Lee was now only nine miles by road from Richmond. He could have wished the distance ten times as great, and he was determined, by engaging Grant as soon as practicable, to avoid a second siege of the capital. But proximity to the city, along with its dangers, was not without some advantages. For one thing, of course, it shortened his communications and lengthened those of his adversary. For another, it gave him the promise of the assistance of the 5,700 troops in the garrison of Richmond when he was close enough for the two forces to be consolidated. And, thirdly, he was now near the line of the Chickahominy, on which General Beauregard had said it would be possible for him to unite with Lee in an offensive. Lee was willing to move even closer to Richmond if Beauregard would designate the place where he would find it most convenient for the two forces to unite. Still uncertain in the early morning of May 28 whether Grant's advance would be down the Telegraph Road or from the Pamunkey, Lee ordered the cavalry to make a force reconnaissance across the Totopotomoy, in the direction of Hosshop, and to ascertain if the strong federal horse in that quarter had infantry behind it. He was somewhat better circumstanced for a vigorous employment of his cavalry now, for he had received the 4th and part of the 5th South Carolina Cavalry and had the assurance that the 6th would soon arrive. These were the large, well-mounted commands that had long been idle in South Carolina while Lee had been pleading for them. A little later in the day he moved his headquarters to the Clark House near Atlee's. He was so unwell by the hour he arrived there that he had to accept a room from the hospitable owner and transact army business indoors. It was the first time since the opening of the campaign that headquarters had not been under canvas. Sick as he was, Lee proceeded to dispose his troops with the greatest care. He advanced the head of Early's Corps to the vicinity of Pole Green Church on the south bank of the Totopotomoy, five miles due east of Atlee's. 
Anderson he put in rear of Early, and Hill he stationed west of Anderson, near Shady Grove Church. If Grant attempted to cross the Totopotomoy, Lee could easily move the other corps into line of battle with Early, and if the enemy's march was down the Telegraph Road, the column could readily be reversed, for Shady Grove was only five miles from the Telegraph Road, thus. The day passed without incident at headquarters, but in front of Haas' shop the cavalry had a vigorous fight with Sheridan's command. The Confederates threw the enemy back against his supports, captured prisoners from the V and VI Corps, and thereby established the fact that Grant had much infantry south of the Pamunkey. But the Grey Troopers were greatly outnumbered and had to face the fire of the Spencer repeating carbine, which was just coming into use. In the end, they were compelled to give ground. The newly arrived South Carolina regiments behaved like veterans. Lee pondered the report the cavalry brought back. If Grant had two corps east of Hosshop, it was fairly certain that his main attack would not be down the Telegraph Road. He had, however, three routes to Richmond from Hosshop. He could march northwestward, avoid the Totopotomoy, and strike for the Central Railroad at Peak's turnout, or, secondly, he could move directly westward against Atlee's, or, thirdly, he could turn south, across the Totopotomoy, enter the Old Church Road, and make for Mechanicsville. There was manifest advantage to the enemy in seizing the Central Railroad. At one stroke, Grant could again sever Lee's communications with Western Virginia and re-establish for himself a rail line of supply from the Rappahannock. Lee applied his maxim that it was always well to expect the enemy to do what he should do, and he anticipated an advance by Route 1 or Route 2 on the map. He accordingly shifted the left of his line somewhat to the northeast and closer to the Totopotomoy. To cover the whole front of possible advance, he made the most of an almost impenetrable area on his right center, between Early's Corps and Breckinridge's command. He left this ground practically unoccupied, though Anderson's Corps was within supporting distance. Ewell was on the right along the Shady Grove Road, Anderson was at an angle behind Ewell's left, then came Breckinridge, on the extreme left was Hill, covering the point where the road from Shady Grove to Hanover Courthouse crossed the Totopotomoy. Nothing happened during the day to test the wisdom of these dispositions. In mid-afternoon, Federals appeared in some force on the south side of the Totopotomoy, in the direction of Ewell's left, but they did not progress far and contented themselves with sharp skirmishing. Lee watched these movements with care and put Anderson on the alert to support Ewell, but he had additional concern on the 29th, General Ewell's condition had become more serious and, in Lee's opinion, necessitated rest at a distance from the army. Early was left in charge and Ewell was given leave of absence, in the hope that he could resume his duties when operations were less active. The high command had changed most alarmingly since the campaign had opened. With Lee himself so unwell that he could hardly leave headquarters, two of the three corps had new chiefs, three divisions were under new major generals, fourteen brigades had changed leaders, and the cavalry were without a head. Lee was anxious about the leading of some of his brigades and was very desirous of making appointments with temporary rank under a bill then pending before the Confederate Congress. A still greater concern on the 29th was the attitude of Beauregard. That officer had become alarmed over the activity of Butler on the Bermuda Hundred Front and on the 27th had been uncertain whether the enemy was preparing to advance or to withdraw. He was convinced that he was occupying twice as many troops as he had, and he so far convinced Mr. Davis that the president on the 28th hinted to General Lee that Beauregard might be doing as much good where he was as he could accomplish with the Army of Northern Virginia. Davis sent one of his aides to Beauregard for further details, only to learn that in Beauregard's opinion for thousand soldiers, but no more than that, had left Butler to reinforce Grant. My force is so small at present, he said, that to divide it for the purpose of reinforcing Lee would jeopardize the safety of the part left to guard my lines and would greatly endanger Richmond itself. Mr. Davis went out to Atlee's during the afternoon to discuss the situation and, in the evening, Beauregard arrived. He maintained in a lengthy discussion that he could spare none of his 12,000 men. Lee did not attempt to gainsay him, much as he desired reinforcement. The conference ended amicably, but without result. Lee had grimly to telegraph the president, if General Grant advances tomorrow, I will engage him with my present force. The best he could hope for the moment was that with Beauregard on the south of the James and the Army of Northern Virginia immediately in front of Grant, the president could spare him some of Ransom's garrison of Richmond. 
but the situation was changed overnight. Early on the morning of the 30th the enemy began to disappear from the Confederate left, where a. P. Hill and Butler's cavalry were on guard, and almost simultaneously there were signs of a new shift by Grant on the right of the Confederate line. Lee's most reliable scout reported that the Federals, in his opinion, were moving along the road to Old Cold Harbor. Putting all this information together, Lee concluded that the Federals would fortify a line along the Totopotomoy and then, will probably make another move by their left flank toward the Chickahominy, as he expressed it to Anderson. He added, this is just a repetition of their former movements. Pending developments, the only practical step seemed to be to strike at that part of Grant's army on the south side of the Totopotomoy, in front of the Second Corps. That corps, though much reduced in number, was in a good position and had already constructed two crossings over the fields to the old church road on which the enemy was demonstrating with cavalry near Bethesda Church. When Early proposed to develop this situation by a vigorous attack, Lee at once approved, subject to Early's discretion. Rhodes was moved to the right and the action was opened. The burden of it fell on Early's old brigade. This command had been led by Brigadier General William Pegram until that officer had been wounded, and then by Colonel Edward Willis of Georgia. As these veterans went forward, Lieutenant Colonel C. B. Christian of the 49th Virginia, which had lost nine color bearers since the opening of the campaign, observed that his regiment was not displaying its flag. Orendorf, said Colonel Christian to a tall, thin boy from Amherst County, will you carry the colors? Yes, Colonel, Orendorf answered. I will carry them. They kid my brother the other day, now, damn them, let them kill me, too. As the line went forward, the Union cavalry quickly withdrew. Rhodes's men passed into a broad field, swept back an opposing brigade and immediately came under a very heavy fire. Their lines were torn by every round, for the Union gunners had the exact range. They charged desperately on, almost to the artillery position, and then, before the eyes of watching remnants, were repulsed with slaughter. Orendorf was torn to bits by a cannonball as he defiantly waved his flag not twenty feet from the enemy. The failure of the attack was complete, though the loss in three of the brigades was comparatively light. During the afternoon, while Early was engaged at Bethesda Church, evidence began to accumulate that reinforcements from Butler were moving to Grant via the White House on the Pamunkey River. Beauregard had forwarded reports on the 26th of suspicious activity in the federal shipping on the James, though he held to his contention that only some 4,000 men had left Bermuda 100. Now the signal officer on the Lower James reported that 17 transports had passed down the river, carrying at least 7,000 men. General Ransom informed General Bragg that a newspaper correspondent had been captured near Tunstall's station and that letters found on him indicated the man's belief that Smith's 18 Corps was at the White House. This corps was known to have been with Butler. Lee's own scouts had it that Butler's fleet, conveying the same corps to Grant, would be at West Point on the 30th. On the basis of this information, and to save time that might be lost in transmitting the request for Richmond, Lee called directly on Beauregard for reinforcements. When that officer answered about nightfall that the War Department would have to decide what troops should be sent, Lee lost patience. The result of this delay, he telegraphed the president, will be disaster. Butler's troops, Smith's Corps, will be with Grant tomorrow. Hoke's division, at least, should be with me by light tomorrow. When Lee used that grim word disaster, the wheels of the War Department turned swiftly. Beauregard was ordered to dispatch Hoke by trains that would be sent him immediately, but before the call reached Beauregard, he, too, had concluded that the risk to Richmond was greater than that on his own line and he advised the department that Hoke's command was to start at once and was to be followed by Bushrod Johnson's division as soon as the movements of the enemy in Beauregard's front would permit. Before midnight, Lee had assurance from the president that every effort would be made to have Hoke's four brigades with the Army of Northern Virginia the next day. This was a good division of more than 7,000 officers and men. Adding it to the reinforcements already received, Lee had now made good approximately 70% of the losses he had sustained since the opening of the campaign, and he was more than ever determined, if he found an opening, to take the offensive in what he told Anderson was the grand object, the destruction of the enemy. Chapter 22, And Still Grant Hammers Cold Harbor, May 31, June 3, 1864 
Now began the last great maneuvers in the campaign from the Rapidan to the James, the maneuvers that were to change the character of military operations in Virginia and substitute siege tactics for field strategy. By dawn on May 31st the right, under Early, had been extended beyond the Old Church Road, which led from the federal position to Mechanicsville and thence to Richmond. The line crossed the road about a mile west of Bethesda Church and four miles east of Mechanicsville. Thence the Confederate front extended irregularly to the north and northwest for a distance of seven and a half miles. The left rested on the Chickahominy Swamp, west of Atlee's Station. The whole line had been well fortified and, if well supported by artillery, could be held by a comparatively small force of infantry. The works admirably covered the approaches to Richmond from the Upper Pamunkey, as will appear from the sketch on the next page. But if Grant was moving by the left flank, as Lee believed, it would be possible for him to swing around to the Chickahominy River and force the Army of Northern Virginia to stand siege in the Richmond defenses. That was the one thing above all others that Lee most desired to avoid, for he knew it could end only in defeat. He must, then, extend his flank to save himself from being chained to Richmond. Fitz Lee's cavalry was already well beyond Early's exposed flank, holding the crossroads at Old Cold Harbor, the strategic importance of which Lee had learned in the campaign of the Seven Days. To support Fitz Lee, the commanding general directed that Hoke's division, which was beginning to detrain in Richmond, should move toward Cold Harbor. The morning of the 31st passed without any development of consequence, but in mid-afternoon, Fitz Lee reported from Old Cold Harbor that the enemy was half a mile from that place and was advancing on it, though only cavalry had been discovered at that hour. Fitz Lee said that he was preparing to dispute the enemy's progress where he stood, but he asked if the Van of Hoke's division, which was then between Mechanicsville and Cold Harbor, should not be ordered to him. General Lee did more than this. Being almost certain that Smith's corps was moving from White House to join Grant, and reasoning that Grant's army would be strung out on the march, he thought he saw an opportunity for striking the blow he had so long wished to deliver. If he could attack the enemy at Cold Harbor, before the Federal left was in position, he might double it up. To this end, Anderson was taken from his position between Breckenridge and Early and was shifted during the later afternoon into Early's position and beyond it. Breckenridge extended his line somewhat to the right until he was close to Beulah Church, which was about one mile northwest of Old Cold Harbor. Kershaw was in position early in the night, Pickett and Field were on the road behind Kershaw. Hoke's brigades were to file in on Anderson's right. The situation then would be as shown on page 76. 15,000 Confederate infantry would be in the vicinity of Cold Harbor by daylight. That force, well handled, should be sufficient to turn Grant's left flank and to create a confusion during which the other corps might attack. The great day might be at hand. What had seemed possible on May 6, when Longstreet had struck the enemies left in the wilderness, might be achieved. About seven o'clock on the evening on May 31, not long before Anderson reported the arrival of his van near Beulah Church, a significant message came from Fitz Lee. The enemy's cavalry, he said, had attacked his troopers and Klingman's brigade of infantry at Cold Harbor and had driven them from the crossroads. Fitz Lee was not sure, but he thought Federal infantry were in his front. Infantry Evidently, then, there was a race for Cold Harbor just as there had been for Spotsylvania Courthouse, and the Confederate infantry, by odd chance, were led by the man who had won before. Lee at once took the precaution of placing Hoke under Anderson and directed that Hoke's rear brigades be hurried to Cold Harbor. Lee doubtless wished to go himself, so that he could himself direct the turning movement, but while he was physically much better, he was still so weak that he had to ride in a carriage. The most he felt justified in doing was to advance his headquarters to Shady Grove, where he would be nearer the center of operations in case Anderson's attack made a general offensive possible. Hope might well have beaten high in the heart of Lee when he retired at Shady Grove on the evening of May 31st. His plans had been well laid and the opportunity at Cold Harbor was great. When he arose on the morning of June 1st and strained his ears vainly for the sound of battle from his distant right, he had every reason to believe that the first courier from Anderson would bring great news. Two years before, in a house not many miles away, he had assumed command of the Army of Northern Virginia, was Anderson about to send him, as an anniversary gift, a report of a stunning victory at Cold Harbor? It was far otherwise. The dispatch that finally reached him told a humiliating story of failure. 
Anderson attacked at dawn, in accordance with instructions. The advance was led by Kershaw's veteran brigade. Lee had been aware that the brigade was without a regular commander and had urged Anderson to name one. Anderson had delayed, or else had been unable to find a suitable man overnight, and he sent the brigade into action on the morning of June 1 under its ranking Colonel, Lawrence M. Keat of the 20th North Carolina, a Green Regiment that had recently joined the Army. Keat was a distinguished antebellum politician and orator who had come to Virginia only a short time previously and had never been in close action. He knew little of the methods of fighting then in vogue in the Old Dominion, and the men of the other regiments were fearful he would make some blunder. He dashed boldly forward, mounted on his charger, and was killed at the first onset. His raw regiment broke and forced the seasoned troops to give ground. Liaison between Anderson and Hoke was incredibly bad, Hoke did nothing, the attack failed and perhaps the greatest opportunity presented the army after May 6 was thrown away. Bitterly as Lee must have been disappointed, he lost no time in repining. If he could not roll up the Army of the Potomac from his right, he must strengthen that flank to keep Grant from tying him down to the Richmond defenses. By doing that, while holding his position on the left, opposite the Totopotomoy, he might yet find an opening. Breckinridge was at once ordered to Cold Harbor to strengthen and to extend the right, and Lee himself prepared to go there in person. As it happened, Breckinridge was absent from his headquarters when the order reached him and Haight's division of the Third Corps was changing position. Ere long, an attack developed on Haight's front which, of course, held Breckinridge temporarily where he was enforced Lee to defer his own start for Cold Harbor. Cook's brigade and Kirkland's, however, easily beat off the enemy. A little later, Breckinridge and Mahone cleared up the ground in their front and took about 150 prisoners. Almost at the same hour the cavalry that was covering the Confederate left met an advance by the Federal horse and drove it back in the dashing style of 1862. These three isolated attacks, if designed to alarm Lee for his left, entirely failed of their purpose. He took them to be mere demonstrations to distract his attention, and some time after four o'clock he started for Cold Harbor. On his arrival he opened headquarters, probably in the field on the right of the Cold Harbor Road, just west of the crossing of Powhite Creek at Gaines's Mill. He found that important events had happened during the afternoon. Fitz Lee, who had been in advance of Hoke's right, had been forced back by superior numbers. This so threatened Anderson's right that he ordered Hoke to extend his flank southward beyond Old Cold Harbor to the terrain won by D. H. Hill in the Battle of Gaines's Mill nearly two years before. The key to this position was Turkey Hill. Knowing its strength, Lee had given particular instructions that it should be occupied fully, but Hoke did not extend his flank any great distance. He might have intended going farther in that direction, but immediately after he made the movement, the enemy attacked with vigor north of the road between New and Old Cold Harbor. The force of the Federal assault broke the lines between the left of Hoke and the right of Anderson. Klingman's brigade of Hoke's division gave way and Wofford's of Kershaw's division had to fall back, but Kershaw threw in two regiments and regained some of the ground. Hunton's brigade of Pickett's division was thereupon sent to Hoke. Working along the left flank of Hoke, the brigade almost closed the gap. The enemy withdrew after nightfall, but contact between Hoke and Anderson was practically lost, and no little confusion prevailed at Anderson's headquarters. Anderson's final dispatch of the day, received by Lee at his new headquarters, was to the effect that he had to be reinforced or his lines would be broken. Lee had already anticipated this need. Breckinridge, as far as Lee knew, was well on the way and should arrive in time to meet the new attack that Lee expected the enemy to make at daylight. But Lee had to look beyond his own army for the strength with which to resist the enemy on a longer line. Writing to the president during the day, he reported a rumored advance of the enemy up the York River Railroad, and he began to question whether Grant might not be making for James River. If so, it was desirable for Beauregard to bring his troops north of the river and to take position on the right of the Army of Northern Virginia. Lee had been trying for days to effect joint action with Beauregard, and he had consistently failed, except for procuring Hoke's division. On June 1, he tried diplomacy anew. First he telegraphed Beauregard of Grant's shift toward the James, adding that he was ignorant of the situation on Beauregard's front and did not know whether it was in his power to leave the Bermuda Hundred Line. 
Beauregard answered that he could not evacuate the south side of the James prior to the departure of the Federals from that quarter unless the government was willing to abandon communications between Richmond and Petersburg. In Lee's opinion that was not desirable, but, he told Beauregard, in an appeal to that officer's known ambition, as two-thirds of Butler's force has joined Grant, can you not leave sufficient guard to move with the balance of your command to the north side of James River and take command of right wing of army? At dawn on the 2D Lee awaited two developments, the arrival of Breckenridge and the resumption of the attack, but he looked in vain for Breckenridge and, when he did not hear from him, was relieved that the Federals withheld their assaults. Anxious regarding Breckenridge, he set out for Mechanicsville, feeble though he still was. He covered the entire distance before he found the Kentuckian at the village with his troops eating breakfast. It was explained that the column had not started until after 10 p.m. from the Confederate left and had then been so weary from its day's fighting that the men had to rest every half hour. Major McClellan, who was acting as guide, had no map and in his ignorance of the country led the troops by a long route. Lee said nothing at the time and contented himself with hurrying the march. Probably while he was at Mechanicsville, Lee learned that the Federals had disappeared from opposite a part of the front of the Third Corps. Reasoning that this meant a still heavier concentration around Cold Harbor, Lee ordered Mahone and Wilcox to march at once for the right and to take position beyond Breckenridge, who was to form south of Hoke, between Old Cold Harbor and the Chickahominy. Lee did not stop with this maneuver. If Grant was throwing division after division to the Cold Harbor sector, he might readily be weakening his right, and if that was the case, then there might be a chance to turn that flank and thereby to upset Grant's plans at Cold Harbor. With this in view, Lee gave discretionary orders to Early to attack if he found a favorable opening, and then he rode once more to the scene of his first victory at Gaines's Mill. He found no change in the situation when he arrived. All was quiet for the time, but a battle was brewing. The very prospect of it seemed to stimulate him perceptibly, and he was almost himself again physically, though his staff had noticed for several days that he was more disposed to remain quiet and to direct operations from a distance. If he had competent lieutenants, Taylor said, tis the course he might always pursue. At last Breckenridge arrived and moved into position. When Major McClellan returned after his unsuccessful adventure as a guide, Lee sent word for him to come to his quarters. McClellan is the best witness to what happened then. With a sinking heart I obeyed. The general was seated on a camp stool in front of his tent, an open map spread out on his knees. When I was in position before him, he traced a road with his index finger and quietly remarked, Major, this is the road to Cold Harbor. Yes, General, I replied, I know it now. Not another word was spoken, but that quiet reproof sunk deeper and cut more keenly than words of violent vituperation would have done. Mahone and Wilcox were now on the road, struggling with heat and dust and thirst. To new troops, the discomforts of the march would have been intolerable, but to the wiry veterans of the Third Corps these things were part of the price they had to pay to beat the enemy, and they were endured with only the casual grumbling and swearing that were their cherished prerogatives. After Mahone came up, he probably went in support of Breckenridge. Wilcox arrived at 3 p.m. and took ground to the right and rear of Hoke, where his men began immediately to entrench themselves. Lee was not satisfied with the position of his right wing. The enemy to the east had better ground and dominated much of Turkey Hill, which Lee had especially enjoined the commanders on the Confederate right to occupy. He had only awaited the arrival of reinforcements to correct this, and he now ordered Breckenridge to prepare for action. Soon, with the support of two of Wilcox's brigades, Breckenridge was thrown forward and the enemy was cleared from the hill. This advance gave Lee artillery control of the bottom land near the Chickahominy and secured his right against any turning movement, but to make that flank invulnerable he extended Wilcox on the right of Breckenridge until he was within half a mile of the river. While making these dispositions, Lee was hopeful that Early had found opportunity of striking a blow on the Confederate left. His first intelligence of what had happened there probably magnified the success, for Lee telegraphed the Secretary of War that Early drove the enemy from his entrenchments, following him until dark. Actually, as Lee subsequently learned, Rhodes had attacked, with Gordon on the right and Haight on his left, and had brushed aside a strong skirmish line but had been halted in front of heavy works thrown up northwest of Bethesda Church. Here the action ended. 
whatever was to be accomplished as a next move must be undertaken on the Confederate right. It was now the end of the 30th day since Lee, from the observation tower on Clark's Mountain, had watched the Federals among their last camps in Culpeper. Never before had the Army of Northern Virginia been so long engaged with the enemy. A week of fighting had sufficed to drive McClellan to Harrison's Landing. A fortnight's defensive operations had hurled Pope's demoralized troops into the Washington defenses. The Maryland expedition had been a matter of 12 days. Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville had been still briefer chapters. Even the ordeal of Gettysburg, from the crossing of the Potomac till the army was safely back on Virginia soil, had lasted but 18 days. Now, after a month, the persistent Federals were still aggressive and apparently were as strong as when, on May 5, the first skirmishers had met in the wilderness. This hammering was having its effect. The morale of the army appeared to be excellent, though the losses had been heavy, the weather oppressive, and rations of the meagerest, but the same grim question was rising in many minds, would the battle never end? Would the enemy continue forever to move around the right flank? Killing Federals, the wags of the army were saying, was like fighting mosquitoes, where one was caught, two would appear. On the defensive, the Army of Northern Virginia was as valiant as it had ever been, but on the offensive, though Lee was almost daily planning some new stroke, the operation was never carried through quite as he had hoped. Was the fault that of the commanding officers, or was war weariness beginning to show at last in those superb brigades? Had it become a struggle of endurance, a test of whether the Army of Northern Virginia would be destroyed before Grant would have enough of the slaughter and would quit? Lee did not ask himself these questions. Save in shaping his strategy and in seeking men and supplies, he never looked into the future, for the future belonged to God, but he knew the limits of endurance, even of his soldiers, and he was struggling hourly to find reinforcements and to outweed his stubborn antagonist so that he could relieve those weary, loyal soldiers who were lying that night in the shallow trenches they had thrown up along the road where they had stopped. There would assuredly be another bloody engagement on the morrow, could Beauregard spare as much as one brigade to help in winning a victory on that old battleground of flaming memories? It seemed doubtful, doubtful even whether Lee could retain all of the thin divisions he had. For here, on the evening of June 2nd, was a telegram from General Imboden at Mount Crawford, saying that General Hunter, who had succeeded Siegel, had the previous day forced him from Harrisonburg in the Shenandoah Valley. Breckenridge had been brought from the valley because Siegel had been driven back. If Hunter was moving up the Shenandoah again, it might be necessary to send Breckenridge back with the two little brigades that were now occupying a critical sector south of the road between the two cold harbors. Could the army hold its own if it were weakened still further? A heavy rain had begun to fall before four o'clock on the afternoon of the 2D and continued to pour down during the night of the 2D 3D. It was in refreshing contrast to the heat and dust of the previous day, but it made duty in the trenches disagreeable, particularly for those men stationed in the bogs created by the little streams that lost their way in wandering westward from the watershed around Old Cold Harbor. And a long line it was on which the soldiers waited for the dawn. Across the Chickahominy, Fitzlee's cavalry watched the crossings to report either an advance on Richmond from the York River Railroad or a movement on Grant's part toward the James. North of the river and within half a mile of it was the right of Wilcox's division. On the left of Wilcox lay Breckenridge, with Mahone in support. Beyond him, northward, was Hoke, his right south of the Cold Harbor Road and his left not quite so much extended as it had been when it had been broken on the afternoon of the 1st, Hunton, of Pickett's division, was between Hoke and Kershaw, with Anderson's, Laws, and Gregg's brigades of the 1st Corps in support. Pickett was on the left of Kershaw, and Field, who was beyond him, connected with Early. Ramser, leading Early's old division, was either on Early's right or in reserve. Then came Gordon. Rhodes was on the left of Gordon, and Haight, of the Third Corps, was on the extreme left. The sketch on the opposite page can only approximate the points of junction of the different units. All along the front, when the rain ceased and the shadows began to gray on the morning of June 3, the ragged veterans manned trenches and stood on the alert. In exposed positions, the guns were charged and primed. Everywhere the feeling was the same, the enemy was surely coming. Why not? That thin, sprawling line was all that stood between him and Richmond. 
At headquarters, Lee was astir with the dawn, busily considering where he should locate his artillery south of the Chickahominy, in case the enemy moved in that direction. Circular orders were issued for the recall of the last man on extra duty. Every rifle would be needed behind the parapet that day. Suddenly, at 4.30, there was a roar of cheers and a crash of musketry beginning on Lee's right and spreading all along the line. An instant after, the thunder of guns swelled from the heights of the Chickahominy far over to the Confederate left. A general assault was on, a determined effort, backed by all the might of the Army of the Potomac, to break through, everywhere, anywhere, and to take the road into the city that woke from sleep, startled at the loudest firing it had ever heard. Lee could only listen to the din and speculate whether it would come closer, for he had not a single regiment in general reserve, and until he could ascertain where the federal assaults were heaviest, he could not weaken one part of the line to strengthen another. The army had to repel the attacks or be destroyed. For five minutes, for ten, the noise was so overwhelming that it was impossible to tell anything except that the whole front was furiously engaged. Through the smoke that hung heavily over the flat country, nothing was to be seen of retreating, routed columns. Now the firing fell away, now it rose again, as if a new assault was being delivered. Shells were falling by this time in the field where Lee's headquarters were located, and soon the wounded began to come back from the front, but they were not numerous. Stoutly, in that inferno, the lines must be holding. The grand assault must be failing, but what of the details? At a word, couriers and staff officers rode off to find the commanding generals on the line and to get reports. As Lee awaited their return, listening intently, the fire on some parts of the line began to slacken perceptibly. From the right, south of the road to Old Cold Harbor there were cheers, federal cheers, and then, ere long, the sound of increased infantry fire, as if new troops had been thrown in. Like a thunderstorm that passes quickly but roars as it passes, the artillery was less furious, though every battery seemed still to be engaged. In half an hour, the first of the messengers round. On the front of Wilcox, no attack had been delivered. The enemy had reached Breckenridge's line and had broken through a bit of swampy ground, but Mahone had sent in Finnegan and the old Maryland battalion and was restoring the front. Hill had shown to Lee's courier the dead lying on one another where Grant had vainly assaulted. Tell General Lee, he said, it is the same all along my front. Hoke reported that the slain and wounded literally covered the ground and that, up to that time, he had not lost a single man in his division. On the sector held by the right of Kershaw, where the enemy had entered the works on the afternoon of June 1st, successive assaults had been pushed with vigor but had been beaten off with ease. Like favorable reports came from the center and from the left, when later messengers returned. On the front of the First Corps, attack followed attack with so much vigor that Anderson by eight o'clock had counted fourteen. From the Confederate works the Federal officers could be heard commanding their men to advance, but as the bloody morning hours passed, the only response to each new order would be a volley from the ground. The men realized it was futile to go on. By eleven o'clock, though the artillery were still thundering and the infantry were exchanging furious volleys, the assaults on all parts of the line seemed to be suspended, for the moment at least. Lee, alone at headquarters, except for a single orderly, was beginning to think of the next phase of the great contest when Postmaster General Reagan rode up. He had come out from Richmond with Judge Meredith and Judge Lyons and had heard the desperate fire. Was not the artillery very active? He asked with the curiosity of the civilian. Yes, said Lee, more than usual on both sides. That does not do much harm here. But, he added, waving his hand toward the line where, Reagan said, the sound of the musketry was like the tearing of a sheet, it is that that kills men. General, said the Texan, if he breaks your line, what reserve have you? Not a regiment, Lee answered, and that has been my condition ever since the fighting commenced on the Rappahannock. If I shorten my lines to provide a reserve, he will turn me, if I weaken my lines to provide a reserve, he will break them. Then, taking advantage of the presence of one who was powerful in the civil councils of the Confederacy, Lee explained the exhaustion of his army and its physical deterioration for lack of vegetables. He had urged the men, he said, to dig and eat the roots of the sassafras and the wild grape, but these were a poor substitute. 
When Reagan returned to Richmond, would he see the commissary general and urge him to send potatoes and onions to the army? Some of the men now have scurvy, Lee added sadly. Reagan promised and changed the conversation to something more personal. There was uneasiness in Richmond, he explained, because of reports that Lee was exposing himself unduly. Could he not discharge his duties equally well by keeping out of danger? Lee answered that he had to be close to the front, though he had sent back the stores and the wagons. I have as good generals as any commander ever had, he went on, and I know it, but still it is well for me to know the position of our lines. To illustrate this, in forming my right, I directed that it should cover Turkey Hill, which juts out on the Chickahominy Valley so as to command cannon range up and down the stream. In forming the line, however, this was not done, and on yesterday afternoon I had to direct General Breckinridge to recover that position by an assault which cost us a good many men. Reagan rode off and Lee turned to the grim task of seeing if he could replace the men who were still falling along the lines under the federal fire. Hoke had reported that he had captured prisoners that morning from the 18 Corps, which had joined Grant from Butler's army. This was what Lee had been expecting since the evening of May 30 and it proved, beyond further quibble, that the force in front of Beauregard had been greatly reduced. Beauregard on the previous day had telegraphed Lee that the Federals still opposed him in strength and that he could not further reduce his troops. Lee now put the facts before the President and added, no time should be lost if reinforcements can be had. The administration was of the same mind and, in a terse exchange of messages, ordered Matt Ransom's brigade from Beauregard to Lee. After 1 p.m. it was apparent that the enemy had abandoned all hope of successful general assaults. The Confederate wounded could now be brought out and the lines could be put in order. On Breckenridge's front the works had been recaptured without heavy loss so that the whole position was now intact. Desultory firing continued until about nightfall. Then, as Breckenridge and Finnegan were establishing their skirmishers, the enemy delivered a final attack, but was beaten off easily. The pickets kept up their nervous dispute and at intervals the artillery would open, but the battle was over. Our loss today, Lee was able to write the president at 8.45, has been small, and our success, under the blessing of God, all that we could expect. That was the most he had to say of the ghastly day that will always cause a shudder whenever the name Second Cold Harbor is mentioned. Lee might have written much more, for while his own casualties had not exceeded 1,200 to 1,500 on the six miles of front, more than 7,000 of Grant's men crowded the field hospitals or lay, in every attitude of agony, on the open ground, in the ditches and among the slash trees. Their agonized cries rose in a tragic chorus, but the sharpshooters were busy everywhere and the suffering northerners could not be relieved from the Confederate lines. No flag of truce came from the Federal side asking for permission to remove the wounded and to bury the dead. The repulse had been an incredible success. Although the Confederates did not know it at the time, the planned major assaults had been broken up within eight minutes after the advance had begun. One observant Confederate brigadier on the left of Hoke's division subsequently confessed that the worst was over before he realized that any serious attack had been delivered. It was, Colonel Venable recorded, perhaps the easiest victory ever granted to the Confederate arms by the folly of the Federal commanders. In the night of misery that covered at last the woods and the trenches, Lee was of course unaware of the effect this final, costly repulse was to have on Grant's strategy, and equally unaware, was it fortunately so? that he had won his last great battle in the field.